here that nobody else is hearing on YouTube because YouTube picks up the stream a little bit late. And so you get this kind of behind the scenes moment. Sup, podcasters. Hey, welcome to the podcast, podcast listeners. Probably live on YouTube now, right? Welcome, YouTubers, as well. Yeah, everybody. You know, I always try to think, oh, I'm doing this stuff for ear pe workers with earbuds. And then I always forget that there's like uh, probably an overwhelming majority of them who don't listen to YouTube. And for me, it was just always like a dub. I'll pay for premium because it's cheap. I, it, relatively speaking, when you're working, if you're listening to hundreds of hours of content, it's worthwhile, you know? And so that was just how I always thought about it. But it's like, oh yeah, not everybody else is me. And a lot of other people are into podcast addict or overcast or Apple or Spotify, whatever you're into, let me know uh, where you listen to this from. And you can probably do that by leaving us a rating on whatever platform that is. But for those who are joining from YouTube, what's up, everybody? How's it going? This is MCM Prime versus CMC Prime, a.k.a. Capital Mondays with Dave and Nance. Nance, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's, uh, it's a beautiful day outside. It's been raining since like 3 o'clock this morning. Um, so I got to kind of lay around and drink coffee and listen to the sweet and soothing sounds of God's tears. Um, which is rare for me. I'm in Phoenix, so it, it, rain is rare, but it's always good. So it's been a good day. We just got out of a, a banger lecture for the uh, Critical Doxology and Time Energy cohort. Um, Benjamin Studebaker graced us with his presence, and he is always always a pleasure. Um, and he presented a very, very interesting um, lecture this morning that I think I know for me has kind of like lit the gas fire under a lot of thoughts that are going on because I want it. It's not even that I want to agree. I do agree with everything he said, but there's still some part of me that wants to problematize it. So that I think that's always a good position to be in. It's like, I like this a lot. I need to dig further. Um, I'm not just dumbly agreeing and I'm not just stubbornly refusing. It's, it's like, no, I'm actually engaged. It was, it was a great lecture. And for those who weren't there, which is probably most of you, let's be honest, uh, because it was really for the subscribers who are attending the critical doxology and time energy seminars that happen on the fourth Sunday of every month. This was a really special one because it was bringing in ancient Greek and Chinese thought in relation to time energy. And I really like his formula where he goes, it's the three T's. It's talent, time energy, and tutelage. I love that. It's alliteration. It's easy to remember. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a great way of packaging something that I was trying to say in my last two books. So, I mean, I, 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 it's, you know, the, the, the resources have to be there. The potential recognition has to be there. You got to have instant, well, that's the tutelage. And also the whole thing about finding your purpose and being, having the time to discover or explore and discover, uh, talent. Exploring interests and discovering talents is how I would frame that. Um, he really just got to it by talking about talent, time, energy, and tutelage. And he shows that, yeah, for Aristotle and for Confucius, this was a given. This was a given. It's only something that we really have to start talking about post Descartes. And so that's why he was calling it, uh, pre, pre, you know, time, energy before Descartes. Uh, and so, because you're listening to this, I want to just offer you a bonus lecture. Uh, even if you're not signed up as a subscriber, even if you're not signed up for CDT, um, I'll happily shoot you the link for that. If you email me at hello.theoryunderground at gmail.com so that you're able to get into it. By the way, shout out to the people who are here live. We got Louis Louise on the YouTube side in the chat. Well, who else is here? Reveal yourselves and don't forget to like it. And by the way, the real team over here on the Discord side, a couple of subscribers, Ian and Theo, great to have you two in here. Yeah, Theo said, back to basics 100%. I also shared with you guys, Theo and Ian, the uh, the link to the YouTube chat pop out so you can uh, pop in and out 
between the two chats. And with that, we're going to start reading Capital Volume 1, Chapter 1, the second half, on fetishization. We could do the whole thing where we say, like, Happy Easter. Um, I could do this whole thing where I give you guys, like, this giant backlog of, of updates. But I did a stream on that yesterday. Nance, I know you haven't watched that stream yet because you've been super busy with Easter. But I just want you to know, I accidentally deleted all of the forums on Theory Underground. The, cha the, the actual website. I accident, so that was, nice. in, that was, that was in the update yesterday. I accidentally deleted all of it. So then I spent the last 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, agonizing over this, going back and forth with the people over at my server. And I was getting kind of thrown from one place to another between all of these different people who are being exploited in India, uh, probably at call centers, right? So they're not even programmers, but like eventually I was able to get to some programmer who was able to restore my site. The, th the problem with that is all of the work that I put into building the new site is now gone <laughs> so that we have a March 14th version of the website built because that's when it was backed up automatically. But it's okay. Um, I, I did... Uh, uh, some kind of a backup of the new site. It's all that work is not done as long as I pay for pro and then I transfer back from the staging sign. Don't worry about it, everybody. That's a bunch of mumbo jumbo you don't have to think about. It's stuff that I had to learn about firsthand. Um, and I'm still figuring it out, obviously. But long and short of it is I have to spend a little bit extra money, but at least it's not really gone. But what I do need from everybody is a little bit of buy in this week. I'm hoping that everybody who's been involved with the forum, who cares about stuff that happened over at the forum, is going to join me in an event I'm calling Moving Day. Moving Day. It's going to be a little party. It's going to be a little party. It's going to happen later this week. I'm going to try to build it around everybody's availability. Uh, people who are very limited on time but have some availability need to message me and tell me what what kind of a schedule they're on. People who have a lot of availability, don't worry about it. Just try to be there. And yeah, it'll probably be something that's at like 10 a.m. my time so that it is doable for people in Europe and Hong Kong. And the reason I want to do that uh, as a moving day thing is because it's we're not taking everything from the old forums and bringing it over to the new forum setup. But we are bringing stuff over that we consider to be canon. And in some cases, that's stuff that we might want to publish in a future volume, right? There's a lot of work that people have put into it. And some of you all have made the mistake of not backing up your posts in your own docs, in your own documents. I've said it like six times, but considering how much stuff we put out there, it's very easy to miss me saying it, right? I should say it every fucking time we do anything. By the way, if you put stuff out on our forums, back it up yourself. I cannot at the end of the day write it in, write it in Google Docs or whatever platform you yeah, use. Yeah. Um yeah. open office, other yeah. office, whatever. Copy and paste into the forums. Um, write it on your end, save it for yourself. A lot of I mean, I wrote several forum threads or responses in threads or whatever on the forums that I thought would just be like a little bullshit thing. And then it turns out, you know, two hours later I had several paragraphs that I was very happy with. And so I actually had to copy them out of the forum and paste them back into a Google Docs. So best practices, start writing in Google Docs or whatever you use, copy and paste into whatever forum you're posting on because you never know what that type of back and forth is going to generate in you. So it's, you should do that everywhere. Yeah, and I'm also going to announce, though we're not going to have a bullshit and hashtag random channel on the Discord, we are going to have a what's on your mind channel, uh, where there's, there's going to be a couple simple rules in place where it's like, obviously don't get, uh, don't, don't treat this like your therapy, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's a semi professional environment, blah, blah, blah. But also like, if you are thinking about something specific, uh, in philosophy, if, and this would be where, was it Ethan had brought up, uh, he, you know, he's like, where do I share something like this? 
And then I'd basically been like, oh yeah, well, we don't have a place to share random stuff. And he's like, oh, that makes sense. Because the whole idea is like, we're trying to build off of what's come before and keep it all relevant to the courses. But the problem with that is people who are coming in are going to want to, to share stuff. And then it's on us to relate it to the courses and to get people kind of pilled on going deeper into the courses. So that's a, that's a, a reform that is underway. And the, the entire, uh, structure of the discord is going to change before moving day. And, uh, people who are there at the beginning of the conversation for moving day will have a little bit of way in, not too much, but you'll have a little influence in how things are being restructured. Cause I've been in conversation with a couple of people, uh, at the inner circle trying to figure out a way to make it a little bit more intuitive, uh, to people who aren't used to discord, but also who aren't used to theory underground and don't understand our priorities. And also who are trying to treat it like a real space. Like you walk into, and then you go down the hall for lectures and across that from that is the theater, but there's also this other area, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's all the discord stuff. But the reason I originally brought up the whole thing about what's on your mind is because being asked that, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or any other social media platform, you might start, you might just say, Oh, I've got like three sentences that I want to write out for somebody. And then, you know, you, you want to share it with the big other is probably what's going on. And then you write those three sentences, but then you realize, Oh, I got to write a few more sentences to kind of explain where, what I'm really getting at. And then you write a couple more paragraphs and then you keep writing and writing and writing. And I've written a couple of chapters that way. I actually have because it, what starts out as a message to I'm imagining like an actual audience. And then I'm like, no, like, this is throw, this is flushing it down the toilet to put it here. I should move it, change it slightly. You're like, cause that's the whole thing. If people say a long post on Facebook, they're just like, uh, uh, and it's just like, it's, it, it comes off as narcissistic, right? And it's just like, oh, you care, whatever. I don't know. And it's like, yeah, well, it's kind of a similar principle to Mikey, uh, at the dangerous maybe publishing a 125 page book as a blog post. It's like, Oh, okay. The point is, is at that moment that you feel like, oh, I'm really writing something now, switch to the notes doc. I was just bringing it back to what Nance was saying. All right. Shout out to the chat on YouTube. We got a bunch more action going on in there. And Tirano said, what does MCM prime versus CMC prime signify? And uh, Theo responded, that's me, Panther, said, the MCM prime cycle is the transformation of money M into commodity C and the change of commodities back again into money M prime of altered value. And then weird Solowski said MC, by the way, what's up weird said MCM equals capitalist mode, CMC equals worker mode. And then, uh, Theo, he said, use money to buy stuff to make more money. Um, what would you add to all of that? Nance? Um, I think, is it in the video that's premiering later where we talked about that or did that already yeah. go up? Actually, I th think we talked about it in a previous episode, but we talk about it again, I think. Yeah. In the, yeah. Or we don't, so I, that I think it might be in the shit. Now I can't remember. Anyway, we, we have talked about it a few times and I think so MCM prime money to buy stuff, to make more money. That's why it's M prime because it's been increased, it's been changed qualitatively or quantitatively in the case. Um, CMC prime kind of uh, insinuates that we use the commodity that we have at our disposal, which is our labor power, which is our time energy converted into something that the market can grasp and manipulate. So we trade our time energy for money so that we can have more C prime so that's on one hand, that's stable housing, that's food, that's all our base needs and some of our desires met. Um, but it also points at like C prime points at time energy. C, C prime points at no, there's something that is qualitatively different about what we're able to do when we have this floor of stability, when we have a strong foundation. Um, that you can't do if if you're you know doing this gig worker the the precariat that we're all a part of nowadays so it's i i like it a lot i i think it's it's uh poetic in a sense and going back to that person who made a comment that i laughed at uh 
in that one video. I thought that was funny. It was the person who was telling us that the C is for, uh, uh, no, 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 that was, uh, someone made a comment. You were like, capital's dry, capital's hard to read. And then this person was like, I find it rather poetic. <laughs> and I was like, LOL, yeah, because dude. like, <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, no, you're, you're right. Like big brain, there are parts that are poetic, but like normal, like, Hey man, shut the fuck up. Dude, dude no, no, it's not poetic. It is a slog, but <laughs> there's but a no, kind right. of commenter. It has <laughs> there's a kind of commenter. <laughs> what did they do? Where was this? Where they were like, "Oh, phenomenology spirits actually easy." I saw that, and I was like, "It was <laughs> what?" <laughs> and I was just like, "Dude, you're not impressing anyone. Like that's not impressive." <laughs> yeah. The moment that you say that, it's like, well, How then you, you didn't do, really. Hello, smart person. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> hello. Yeah. At the point that you're saying that, it's like, okay, you're not really reading it, or, yeah, you're not really reading it. Yeah. Um, you're not reading. You're not reading. You're consuming. You're you're symbolically. I'm such a smart person. I enjoy the poetry of capital. I think, in our group, in our circle of trust, right? Like, I can say something like that to you earnestly. And I can be like, that's beautiful. But if I'm saying that publicly, I'm putting on, like I'm, I'm trying to stunt and yeah. you shouldn't do that, dude. Like, just, yeah, like yeah. know your audience. Yeah. Just be like, yeah, that shit's hard as fuck. And then, and then when you're in a room with people who, you know, have read it and done the actual work, then you can wax poetically about the beauty that's contained in this 3000 word or 3000 page book about economics ultimately that shit's not well, poetic Shut and up. We're you're about, not impressing we're, us we're about to get into the most beautiful part of it of at least in the beginning part uh of the book that is the section on the fetishism of the commodity and its secret of course that is the most poetic part but that's like after 40 pages of repeating over and over and over again uh that 20 yards of linen equals one coat <laughs> <laughs> That's not poetic. I think maybe you can enter a kind of stupor from reading capital where, you know, words don't make sense anymore. Everything smells like pink. Like, like you're just like, you're being hit in the head over and over and over again so many times where, you know, I can smell letters. Like, sure, yeah. then it can be beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, after you've given yourself, uh, Dos Capitalian brain damage, yes. But for the time being, <laughs> for the time being. Um, all right. I think that everybody has explained uh, CMC Prime enough as, but as far and how it contrasts with MCM Prime. Uh, but I would also just add that when we're thinking C Prime and we're thinking about these things being used to give more time energy. It's not just commodities for the sake of consumerism at, you know, it's like, sure, get whatever things you need and also excess in whatever way you need to, in order to get back to what matters. Well, then another way of saying it, and I, I have this, I wrote this out and I've been waiting to click enter in the chat. So check it out. Going off of the lecture from earlier, it's C M T T T prime which is talent, time, energy, tutelage, which is to say, yeah, I trade my commodity, which is time, energy, because I don't have anything else, into labor power, right? And so C stands for the commodity labor power, right? Which is why I don't have time, energy. But then I use my money to try to get the talent, time, energy, and tutelage necessary. Now, obviously, doing that at the individualistic level, that just means... Uh, taking your kids to piano practice and going to jujitsu and, and running and, and doing all that while you're working full time. And it's obviously not the same as finding your real talent, cultivating it, pursuing your calling and doing so outside of the, the coercive market that requires your, your time and energy as labor power. And so you're not just fighting an uphill battle, but it's almost impossible. And that's the point. It is that it is possible. And so what we actually need is uh some kind of a general restructuring of the society um and then that's where it gets into the whole question of communism i addressed that yesterday i'm not a communist um theo is our token communist 
And outside of Theo, everybody else is some, uh, variant of a free thinker or edgelord or philosopher or, or, or whatever. And we're all uh, only really loosely associating on the basis of we want to understand the situation and we want everybody to be able to have their talent, time, energy and tutelage. And some people want to call that the left. Other people want to call it something else. I am uh, in a uh, methodological post-left position here. And methodological as, a, as opposed to identitarian, it means it's not my identity, dude. I don't care. And it's not going to be me for the rest of my life. It means that I am strategically pre uh, suspending my presuppositions and my master signifiers and my big other. And I am trying to get back to basics, which is what actually Theo just said up above. Back to basics, baby. And so reading... Capital as a way of life is how we're going about that. And if you're curious about what I just said, go watch the stream from yesterday. But I think this is about Marx's amazing work, Das Kapital. Let's get to it. Section four, the fetishism of the commodity and its secret. A commodity appears at first sight an extremely obvious, trivial thing, but its analysis brings out that it is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. So far as it is a use value, there is nothing mysterious about it, whether we consider it from the point of view that by its properties it satisfies human needs, or that it first takes on these properties as a product of human labor. It is absolutely clear that by his Activity, man changes the forms of the materials of nature in such a way as to make them useful to him. The form of wood, for instance, is altered if a table is made out of it. Nevertheless, the table continues to be wood, an ordinary, sensuous thing. But as soon as it emerges as a commodity, it changes into a thing which transcends sensuousness, which means it becomes non-empirical. It not only stands with its feet on the ground, but in relation to all other commodities, it stands on its head and evolves out of its wooden brain grotesque ideas far more wonderful than if it were to begin dancing of its own free will. Definitely the most poetic this book's going to get for at least another hundred pages. The mystical character of the commodity does not therefore arise from its use value. Just as little does it proceed from the nature of the determinants of value. For in the first place, however varied the useful kinds of labor or productive activities, it is a physiological fact that they are functions of the human organism and that each such function, whatever may be its nature or its form, is essentially the expenditure of human brains, nerves, muscles, and sense organs. Secondly, with regard to the foundation of the quantitative determination of value, namely the duration of the expenditure of the quantity of labor, this is quite palpably different from its quality. In all situations, the labor time it costs to produce the means of subsistence must necessarily concern mankind, although not to the same degree at different stages of development. And finally, as soon as men start to work for each other in any way, their labor also assumes a social form. So, the line here, by the way, about how it's the, uh, he doesn't just call it labor, he calls it the expenditure of human brain, nerves, muscles, and sense organs. And I think that's really important uh, because though we want labor to not be the measure of value or the basis of value. It is. And it is in this situation that we are in, which means that everything you've ever gotten off the grocery store shelf is from the expenditure of human brain, nerves, muscles, and sense organs. And then this is where I would add, this is also the other side of the expenditure is like, uh, because a human being has put their brains, nerves, muscles, and sense organs into that product, not just that product, but all of the products of its kind, 
and not just all the products of its kind, but also the fact that it's there. Someone had to get it there. All the way down the supply chain, all the way back through the whole uh, system of, dis of production, all of the brain, nerves, muscles, and sense organs that have gone into it from each human being has foreclosed their futures, their horizon of possibilities. That's the point is, is like they can't find their talent, their time, energy, their tutelage, because that's what they've done instead. There's been a tremendous sacrifice because there's nothing more precious than a human being's ability to find their talent, pursue their calling, and do so with time energy under tutelage. There's nothing more precious than that. And they don't have that. And you know they don't have that because of the product that you're holding. The thousands of people involved in the pen that I'm holding right here, they didn't get to have three squared, which is what Theo said, right? Three squared or T squared, which was talent, time, energy, tutelage. And when they didn't get to have that, that means that they come from a broken family. And it means that they come from a hollowed out community, which means that their culture is a simulacrum. And then he says, secondly, with regard to the foundation of a quantitative determination of value, namely the duration of that expenditure or the quantity of labor, this is quite palpably different from its quality, right? And this is getting at that distinction between quantity and quality, right? Now, some people think that all Marx is doing is saying that under capitalism, uh, quantity overtakes quality, and that's the problem, and we just have to find a way to get back to quality away from quantity, um, and that's and that comes by prioritizing use value over exchange value. That's I don't think that's true, um, but it is something to pay attention to, and I might be wrong. So, you know, stay alert whenever he's talking about quantity and quality. And then he says, in all situations, the labor time it costs to produce the means of subsistence must necessarily concern mankind, although not to the same degree at different stages of development. It must concern mankind, but it doesn't concern everybody. And this is, in private conversations, what Nance was referring to as the I drink wine and don't think about where stuff comes fr from mentality. <laughs> right? Like, uh, sustenance, bare, bare necessities for everybody. That is a given that humans have to think about. But there's a kind of person who doesn't have to. And finally, as soon as men start to work for each other in any way, their labor also assumes a social form, which is to say, it did not just come from some individual artisan. Uh, it comes from the socialization of labor. And even if you go to the, to the farmer's market and pick up something made by an individual artisan, that individual artisan comes from the broader world of socialized labor and that so that it, that was the condition of their possibility to be able to make that artisan good whence then arises the enigmatic character of the product of labor as soon as it assumes the form of a commodity clearly it arises from the form itself the equality of the kinds of human labor takes on a physical form in the equal objectivity of the products of labor as values the measure of the expenditure of human labor power by its duration takes on the form of the magnitude of the value of the products of labor. And finally, the relationships between the producers within which the social characteristics of their labor, of their labors are manifested, take on the form of a social relation between the products of labor. And this has already been established because he's already shown that socially necessary labor time, the average time that it takes uh, when you're just hiring employees, um, in a society, that that becomes a fundamental aspect of how commodities are being measured. And arguably, I, I think for the political economists, uh, that he's, you know, he's doing this imminent critique of, it's also the sole measure of value. I don't know. I don't know. Obviously, he said in this very chapter that nature 
is also one of the sources of value. But we're talking about the measure of the magnitude of value. Um, and I, so for this school of thinking, uh, it is socially necessary labor time and, uh, how supply and demand factor in to the, the, how a price is derived, um, and, and how, you know, that factors in at the level of exchange and whether that really does factor in for Marx, if that is a way that he's extending that or not, this is one of the big questions that we've been trying to track. It's a big, you know, so it's one thing to be like our friend Ted Reese and say that, no, labor is the sole source of value. Done. Full stop. It's another thing to say it is the measure of value. It's also the source of all of our products along with nature. And then to go the next step and say, but then when we, you know, well, does exchange factor in as a determinant of its value as well or just of its price? Because because the price is not the value, right? Or like the the empty space of exchange, like the the fact that this will be exchanged, like things are produced for exchange, like that's a condition of possibility for value for measuring value in this way, and like even nature, at, at like a a field would be measured against uh, how long it would take someone to produce something of, you know, exchangeability from that land. So like land can serve as the source of value, but only once it's been worked upon by man, like only once labor's been put into the ground, can it have value? And only, only because a commodity is going to the market, do we need this measure of value? Does this measure of value become possible? Does it become relevant? Blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's complex. And I think anyone saying, no, it is this one absolute. Um, I think you should always be skeptical of, of simple answers. So, By the weird, by the weird, I meant to say, by the way, weird Solowski, but I got ahead of myself there. By the weird. <clears throat> Uh, said, I'd like to get my hands on basic philosophical vocab list, like a lingo chart or something, learn some key terms and finally become a tier zero and ask questions with an effort to not be annoying. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one better here, Solowski, if you really want me to take you up on that, because I, I would like to take you up on that. Um, what you can do, you can become a tier zero subscriber by signing up as a free subscriber over at the Patreon. But if you do that and genuinely want to work on this vocab list with me and we could like email each other back and forth a little bit, um, I'll program the, the night bot so that people can do a command in the chat so that next time somebody asks about a specific vocab term, if it's one we've already worked on and programmed, then you'd be able to just trigger it in the chat. Um, and the definition would show up there. And so I'm a hundred percent down to do that because it's already something that I've wanted to do for like seven years. So I just need somebody else who's like really wants to make it happen. And so what you could start doing is besides, uh, subscribing as the free tier over at Patreon, that way I'll have your email and we can, you know, communicate through DMs on there. Um, also, uh, come up with a list of starter vocab words that you think of that are related to what we are doing here. And I think you've seen enough stuff at Theory Underground that you probably could generate a list of anywhere between 20 and 50 terms. Great, great idea, man. And then if you put your time energy into that, put some effort into it, and then I actually make it happen uh, together with you, I'll just give you tier one uh, on the Discord side as well. So you'll have access to a bunch of shit you wouldn't have had otherwise just as and it, i'm putting this out there to you but if so but if you decide you don't want to take me up on it <laughs> it's totally okay but if somebody else wants to take I, i'm just saying i want to do it with somebody let's make that happen all right the mysterious character of the commodity form consists therefore simply in the fact that the commodity reflects the social characteristics of men's own labor as objective characteristics of the products of labor themselves 
as the socio-natural properties of these things. Hence, it also reflects the social relation of the producers to the sum total of labor as a social relation between objects, a relation which exists apart from and outside the producers. Through this substitution, the products of labor become commodities, sensuous things which are at the same time super sensible or social. Yeah, and that's like a crucial, crucial part of this whole, the whole development of this, right? Through this substitution. The mysterious character of the commodity form consists, therefore, simply in the fact that the commodity reflects the social characteristics of men's own labor as objective characteristics of the products of labor themselves, as the socio-natural properties of these things. If anybody was there for that lecture I gave on estranged labor, right? You've put yourself into this object. But of course, he goes further here in capital because he's saying, but that object is already the social thing. It's not about you and that. It's about like this, this thing you've put yourself into that is essentially social. Hence, it also reflects the social relation of the producers to the sum total of labor as a social relation between objects, a relation which exists apart from and outside the producers. Though he doesn't say it, I take that to be socially necessary labor time still. And so it's through that, through that substitution that the products of labor become commodities. It's this comparison and now being exchangeable thing that makes them equal in some way. Through that, sensuous things which are at the same time super sensible or social. In the same way, the impression made by a thing on the optic nerve is perceived not as a subjective excitation of the nerve, but as the subjective form of a thing outside the eye. In the act of seeing, of course, light is really transmitted from one thing, the external object, to another thing, the eye. It is a physical relation between physical things. As against this, the commodity form and the value relation of the products of labor within which it appears have absolutely no connection with the physical nature of the commodity and the material relations arising out of this. It is nothing but the definite social relation between men themselves, which assumes here for them the fantastic form of a relation between things. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must take flight into the misty realm of religion. There the products of the human brain appear as autonomous figures endowed with a life of their own, which enter into relations both with each other and with the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. I call this the fetishism which attaches itself to the products of labor as soon as they are produced as commodities and is therefore inseparable from the production of commodities. It's probably a great part for you to start reading after, but let's talk about it for a second. As Theo said in the chat here, actually, I'm going to show this chat on screen because I can't do that now. Boom. Check it out, everybody. Boom. You can see the chat. Oh, my God. Ian, I hadn't seen that you said uh, that you quoted Simon Sinek as saying time is our most precious commodity, but that's amazing. Simon Sinek is perfect for the critical doxology and time energy uh, doxological artifacts that we engage with, right? He's uh he's very much one of these people that you know the the bosses at Fortune 500 companies fly in to give a to give a workshop. Uh but yeah, so Theo's saying this is important. So um this this is very much like what he was doing in the estranged labor section, which is taking this example of how you put yourself into uh, the thing and comparing that to religion because he gets that from Feuerbach, right? 
But he's not talking about estrangement here. He's talking about fetishization. I'm curious what you all think is the essential difference between an emphasis in this dynamic on fetishization as opposed to estrangement. Yeah, it kind of is like two different ways to describe the elephant. Um, like on one side, the, the alienation is from our perspective, what's, what's happening to us through our own activity, um, and kind of describing that to people who kind of take it for granted because it is very easy to take for granted this situation like well this is just how it is like and that like that answer like when when i was a kid and i was dissatisfied with the way the world worked people would always come back and be like well that's just the way it is and that's that's a very easy position to hold because we are all powerless to do anything about anything and you kind of just have to be like well that's just the way it is because it is just the way it is um and like throwing your body against that brick wall is just going to destroy you. And if you do it in this, you know, this position, maintaining this myth of individuality, that's all you're ever going to be able to do is break your body against the wall. Um, so it's very easy to take for granted the situation and just say, well, that's just the way it is. Um, so describing the estrangement, the alienation from ourselves and from the very productivity of our own bodies is a way to kind of reach people and and be like, it is the way it is, but it's also fucked up and we should do something about it. Um, and kind of sowing dissent or dissatisfaction and um, focusing on the fetishization is, is saying like, look, this is how it operates. Like this is how the wool gets pulled over your eyes. This is why it's easier to say that's just the way it is than to become violently displeased and, and want to do something about it, this fetish of value, this idea that we are all commensurable, that we're all fungible, um, that's how it works. So he's, he's describing the problem just at different st stages, maybe, of, of, the, of the problem and how it operates in our individual lives and in our social lives. Um, and then the cautionary sort of brake pedal that Sahil was pumping in the comment section the first time we did this at this point would then say what you just said about the wool being pulled over our eyes without anything else being added to it leaves people under the assumption that, well, as long as you see through the fetishization, then you know it's not real, but it is real. And the thing is, is yeah. in that se and that this is where Catrone said too. He said, God is real in this sense. And mm -hmm. what he means by that, as an atheist that he is, like what he means by that and what Marx would mean by that, though Marx doesn't put it that way, is no, you've objectified your own powers outside of yourself into this other being. Well, guess what? Now you don't have those powers. And just telling a person, well, that's not real, doesn't mean that they then have those powers back. Doesn't mean they are now suddenly empowered. In the same way, uh, he said, the products of the human brain appear as autonomous figures endowed with a life of their own, right? Well, now we're talking about the products not just of the human brain, but also of the n human nerves, muscles, and sense organs, appear as autonomous figures endowed with a life of their own. The PlayStation appears as an autonomous thing with a life of its own. The pen that I was waving around earlier appears as something autonomous with a life of its own. But every one of these things is not just the product of human brain, nerves, muscles, and sense organs, and then I would also add the structural stultification of talent, time, energy, and tutelage for all of the people in the line of production, as well as everybody in their families who didn't get to have a relationship with someone that was in their family. Um, that, all of that, um, is the condition for these things, 
functionally being autonomous figures. They are autonomous figures. So it's not just that that it, it yeah, appears. They've, they've been, it's not just appearing as autonomous. They've been objectified, which means that you could stop existing now. You could die. You could die. And all of these commodities would keep operating without you. Right. Um, you think it has Dude, something I've, to do with I've you reading, and your desires. I've been reading Sone Rethel, um, with intellectual manual labor for, I guess, in preparation to take a stab at, at formulating why I hate value so much, but it is just that like these things have been objectified. They have been turned into, um, real things that operate in the world independently from us. And it's like in the situation we're currently in, we're being led around by the dick by these monstrous figures. Um, or I guess the, the monstrous uh, figure of value itself. But it is embodied in, in all these things, like all, all the things outside of us, they are real and it does operate in the world. There is a monster hiding under your bed and you can't escape from it just by saying, I don't believe in it anymore. It's actually fucking there. Um, you can't just shine a flashlight on it. Like you have to, you have to come up with a new fucking monster killing mechanism. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and show chat here because Theo said, that's just the way it is. In quotes, that's just the way it is. Our society is organized around the reality of what things are objectively worth. Our working conditions reflect this. How can one be alienated from reality? And then he said, Marx lifts the veil and shows us that the material relationship between commodities is actually the social relationship between people. And then Sean said, doesn't this mean that the only agora of society was the marketplace? Now that this agora has moved online, there just isn't one? I like that. I wonder what Benjamin Studebaker would have to say about that, but I do like yeah. it. And I think maybe instead of saying it's the marketplace, you could just say it's... I don't know, like th this idea of the socius, the, this idea of the public. Um, I, I would, and now I would that add, it is online. It yeah, no, Sean, I, I will definitely send you that lecture if you don't, if you don't, if you're not already on the email list for it, but I think you are, uh, when it goes out later today, the Studebaker lecture that, that Nancy's kind of referring to here. Um, I think the point would be that in, a Confucian society or an, a largely like uh, Aristotelian society, the Agora is not the marketplace that actually, as Aristotle says, somebody who's been in the marketplace has to wait 10 years before they can enter the public sphere, 10 fucking years. And that's because they've been so polluted. They're not able to think like a free human being. And you know, the, there are, there were free people. We, we always just forget that there were free people. Now, there is no agora in Marx's time. There is no agora in our time. And the, the reason is because there's no public place where free people can genuinely get together and actually decide their destinies or fates or however you want to talk about that. I guess it would be destinies. So, but it's like, no, to decide on the direction that you're going. To, to, to choose history together. That's what free human beings mm. would do. And free human beings traditionally relied on slavery and conquering enemies and putting them to work. And, uh, but guess what? When you've got slaves doing stuff for you, you don't have to think about everything like a market because they got your, ne your necessaries taken care of. They've also got some luxuries taken care of, like they, but they're doing it. And it's slavish to be preoccupied with. Uh, necessary labor. It's slavish to, to be willing the end that is not the good life, right? That's, that's all coming out of that lecture. And I would, and, and the crazy thing, the crazy sort of Marxist meets Nietzschean, but not Nietzschean. It's really just Aristotelian kind of, uh, uh, uh sort of aristocracy is to say they were right. They were right. Uh, they could have spent their whole lives growing their own tomatoes and getting raided by the neighbors, like the Spartans, or they could 
build a society where some people at least get to be free. And the idea of everybody being able to get freed from necessary labor, or at least freed enough that everybody could pursue talent, time, energy, and tutelage so that if they made themselves into something worthwhile, then they would actually be able to enter that public sphere. That wasn't on the radar as a, as a serious, plausible possibility because there was no, uh, no, there weren't, there wasn't, uh, I'm, what, the word I'm looking for is automation. It, it, but, it, yeah, it, it, it is an innovation of capital, this idea of equality, right? The, the, the idea that not only can people be free, but the question of freedom, like the, the, the people that were free, it wasn't a question. It was their condition. They were born into it. They inherited their freedom. Um, and the idea of upward mobility, the idea of, of equality, the idea of ubiquitous justice that wasn't like some divine right or whatever is an innovation. Um, and, and that's why bringing Marx back to the classics like Aristotle um, can actually show us uh, we don't have to throw away Aristotle. We don't have to call Aristotle a fascist. Um, we can iterate on, yeah. on this idea of freedom. We took this in a completely different direction than Sean meant to take it. Uh, yeah. But Sean, yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad we misread you because otherwise, uh, I would have, we wouldn't have said all that stuff, uh, which, you know, is important to get to. But no, what you were talking, so everybody, what Sean was talking about was he, he didn't really mean third like places. Yeah. He just meant like third places where people get together. Yeah. And of course, like, the only commons that we've ever known, the only third places that we've ever known were markets. And the internet is still a market. The underground is still, uh, paid for, is still funded. You're, you're all paying for my labor. Um, this is, this is a market. I'm, a, I'm in a, in an attention economy and everybody else on it is also getting paid to be there, uh, unless they're, yeah, well, almost like 98% of the content on YouTube is paid for. And it is a market. And in a sort of sense, it's sad. It's, it's really sad because like, it's not the goal. Like the goal is not, the goal would be this, this higher kind of word that we're using for Agora, like this sense, this higher sense for the word Agora. But this lower sense, yeah, all we've ever known is markets is 100%, 100%. Nance, you could take it from there. Um, I'm still listening, but I'm going to step you away. <clears throat> As the foregoing analysis has already demonstrated, this fetishism of the world of commodities arises from the peculiar social character of the labor which produces them. Objects of utility become commodities only because they are the products of the labor of private individuals who work independently of each other. The sum total of the labor of all these private individuals forms the aggregate labor of society. Since the producers do not come into social contact until they exchange the products of their labor, the specific social characteristics of their private laborers appear only within this exchange. In other words, the labor of the private individual manifests itself as an element of the total labor of society only through the relations which the act of exchange establishes between the products and through their mediation between the producers. To the producers, therefore, the social relations between their private laborers appear as what they are. In other words, they do not appear as direct social relations between persons and their work, but rather as material relations between persons and social relations between things. It is only by being exchanged that the products of labor acquire a socially uniform objectivity as values, which is distinct from their sensuously varied objectivity as articles of utility. This division of the product of labor into a useful thing and a thing possessing value appears in practice only when exchange has already acquired a sufficient extension and importance to allow useful things to be produced for the purpose of being exchanged so that their character as values has already to be taken into consideration during production. From this moment on, the labor of the individual producer acquires a twofold social character. On the one hand, it must, as a definite useful kind of labor, satisfy a definite social need, and thus maintain its position as an element of the total labor, 
as a branch of the social division of labor, which originally sprang up spontaneously. On the other hand, it can satisfy the manifold needs of the individual producer himself only insofar as every particular kind of useful private labor can be exchanged with it. In other words, counts as the equal of every other kind of useful private labor. Equality in the full sense between different kinds of labor can be arrived at only if we abstract from their real inequality. If we reduce them to the characteristic they have in common, that of being the expenditure of human labor power, of human labor in the abstract. The private producer's brain reflects this twofold social character of his labor only in the forms which appear in practical intercourse, in the exchange of products. Hence, the socially useful character of his private labor is reflected in the form that the product of his labor has to be useful to others, and the social character of the equality of the various kinds of labor is reflected in the form of the common character, as values, possessed by these materially different things, the products of labor. <clears throat> Men do not, therefore, bring the products of their labor into relation with each other as values because they see these objects merely as the material integuments of homogeneous human labor. The reverse is true. By equating their different products to each other in exchange as values, they equate their different kinds of labor as human labor. They do this without being aware of it. Value, therefore, does not have its description branded on its forehead. It rather transforms every product of labor into a social hieroglyphic. Later on, men try to decipher the hieroglyphic to get behind the secret of their own social product, for the characteristic which objects of utility have of being values is as much men's social product as it is, as is their language. The belated scientific discovery that the products of labor, insofar as they are values, are merely the material expressions of the human labor expended to produce them, marks an epoch in the history of mankind's development, but by no means banishes the semblance of objectivity possessed by the social characteristics of labor. Something which is only valid for this particular form of production, the production of commodities, Namely, the fact that the specific social character of private labors carried on independently of each other consists in their equality as human labor and in the product, assumes the form of the existence of value, appears to those caught up in the relations of commodity production, and this is true both before and after the above-mentioned scientific discovery, to be just as ultimately valid as the fact that the scientific dissection of the air into its component parts left the atmosphere itself unaltered in its physical configuration. <clears throat> they do this no. without being aware of it. Mikey yo, yo, yo. in the house. Mikey no neck. Hey. Get over here, Mikey No Neck. What's up, man? Uh, What's up, Mikey? You can also, Mike, if you want, you can also get in on the Discord side. If you ever want to say something that will get shown on the screen, I can like show the Discord chat on the screen, blah, blah, blah. You didn't miss too much, just all the coolest parts of the stream. Now we're in new territory. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't miss anything except the cool shit. Yeah, <laughs> we got into the three T's. T squared. That yeah, shit man. Was T awesome. squared, dude. Um, yeah, and honestly, dude, like, there's so much synergy between uh, the way Benjamin talks about it and the way you talk about it in time energy. Why you have no time or energy um, available worldwide on the internet. Second edition with a forward by Slavoj Žižek. Audio version coming soon. Um. But yeah, I do talent, time, energy, and tutelage. Um, that shit's a banger, Mikey. Can't wait to talk to you about that shit. I just put the circuit up there. So it goes CMC minus because the commodity is, mm. as your labor power, it's like going away. And then uh, MCM prime for the capitalist. And then time energy M T uh, squared. 
that's well so so taking taking the fragment on a strange labor seriously we only have access to cmc minus right you you can't get it uh you can't get c prime you have to you have to start playing by different rules and so it necessarily would be cmc minus <laughs> yeah and we want cmc t, t cubed like what we meant by c prime we've uh, we've explained but this is yeah. a more but now we're getting more granular we're getting more uh, uh -huh. precise yeah also uh maton said i think aristotle is wrong in pathologizing the negative impacts of markets they have their own means of enforcement through debt which is more binding than any fantasies the market may instill in you uh through yeah, proximity. david graber yeah oh maton yeah it sounds like some Graeber or some MMT kind of, but I mean, there's two kinds of debt, man. And market debt is not the kind of debt that actually binds people together I mean, in any serious or real or worthwhile way. Yeah. You want to talk about symbolic exchange or do you want to talk about exactly like, uh, like financial debt? I, I get the, I, or I get maybe the sentiment or what I get out of that. Like, sure. Symbolic exchange. You're entering into a relationship of debt. He's out in. Uh, a relationship of debt that kind of concretizes your belonging and you, you could call it debt i don't like calling it debt though like i like calling it belonging right you don't because yeah do, belonging... don't don't conflate that with my student loan debt that's not fucking it's not the same shit like that's right at, at that point you're to, just look, you're fair, not using we're not using words at that point like to be fair though belonging does you know kind of weigh weigh on you um, you had no choice in your own personal history. So it, it does weigh on you. So it, I don't like, sure. But also like, no, it's, it's not just that. Like, uh, I like the fact that Aristotle is like, no, man, if, if you have to fucking fuck with the market in any way, <laughs> you just can't think. I love that. I'm a hundred percent behind that. Kind of yeah. Included in, we're that's why we're that's, all idiots that's included in how i've been approaching yeah exactly we're all idiots we're trying to produce yeah. conditions of possibility to no longer be idiots we're idiots we're not smart we're not up here being the smart guy who's read all the books and who knows all the things we're up here saying we're fucking stupid let's try to be less stupid so that maybe somebody someday <laughs> can start thinking again yeah because we can't and uh the, as far as like why we can't, I mean, we've already gone over it a thousand times and I, ri you know, this, it's in the book, but, uh, I mean, not just this book, which also it is in this book, but you know, I'm, I'm also trying to get at it in the time energy book, but it's like, yeah, no, the hundred percent agree with you on the, uh, symbolic bonds and the sense of obligation we have to one another being the bedrock of everything and that that's where Levinas and Graeber and Baudrillard can all be read alongside one another in like this really synergistic way but you can't let the Austrian eco economists and mm -hmm. and the neo and the neoclassical guys and the fucking MMT guys all come in here from their stupid business and economics department like oh well we fucking know things and then they start conflating what what I just said with all of those thinkers with Oh, like, you know, monetary debt through the banking system, which is fucking, it's like another beast altogether. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, it's not, there's, uh, there's something there. Like, I, I don't want to say, oh, that's stupid. That's bullshit. There's, there's something there. Um, but it's just different. We're playing a different game. Here's, here's, um, here's where we could, I can dignify the Austrian position or the libertarian position a little bit like this. I can dignify it. I, I disagree with it, like in the long run, but in the mm. short run that they are right, we are either in trade or war at any given moment mm. and better trade than war, which means that under capitalism, trading with one another is the only way of not being at war with one another, right? At, at the moment that you say, we're not trading with you anymore, that's an act of war, right? You say, oh, yes. well, no one's allowed to trade with Cuba. No one's allowed to trade with Russia, right? Act of war. And it breaks. And so, it, you know, when the United States is in a lot of debt to these other countries, there is a kind of 
working relationship between those countries. And that's something Graeber does say, you know, which is just to say like, uh, that's actually good, right? Like, oh, mm-hmm. we're not going to go to war because we want to get our money back from the United States. So it's like, and then of course there's military force backing that up. There's, it gets complicated, but no, the kind of, the kind of debt that we care about is better spoken of in some other term, not debt, because debt gets us into this other territory where it's like, yeah, practically speaking in the short term, sure. But no, we're talking about symbolic exchange. Marcel Moss, Baudrillard. Uh, we, want, we want something more. We want Levinos. T cubed. We don't want C minus. Theo said another interpretation is that war is a necessity of capitalism. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely, man. And is also the motor of technological progress. I don't know. Whenever I hear that one from my Trotsky friends or my Marxist Leninist friends, uh, I always am just like, uh No, look, I don't Okay. I'm always just I like, uh I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's a necessity. I would, uh, I would say it's it's very descriptive, but I wouldn't ever say it's prescriptive, right? And I don't think it's the only motor of technological development either. I think sex is also a motor. I think pleasure can also be a motor. Like sometimes you I just didn't wanna... mean the motor. I didn't mean the motor part. I meant the war is a necessity oh, of war capitalism. War is a necessity of capitalism. Yeah, because it's just like whatever. It's I just like so, it's like. It's like you could draw the line. You could draw the line and say that sometimes capital needs to do this, needs to burn off some surplus or whatever. Uh, but that's, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I, the moment you start saying that wars are necessary, um, it's just like, okay, but not all the time, but they're fucking not all the time. Guess what? Sure. Human beings getting together in a room and having a real conversation can mean that instead of a war, we see a new period of prosperity. That is fucking possible, even within capitalism, but also within every other civilization for all human co- t- time. And that when when people go into a totalitarian brain space where they're just like, nope, it's barbarism. Mm-hmm. So long as we're in capitalism, it's barbarism, bitch. And that's all it can be. The moment you do that, oh, well, why don't you just fuck it with friends like this who needs enemies, right? Like, why don't you just fucking write, <laughs> write their propaganda for them, right? Like Lenin did for the fucking Nazis. Mm. Lenin wrote uh, his uh, leftism uh, infantile uh, disorder. Uh, and guess what? That was the one fucking book by Lenin not banned when Hitler came to power. Why? Because he was writing the enemy's propaganda for them and he didn't even realize it. Right? It's because totalitarians love that shit. I would, uh, to, to defend the statement, I would just get, I would put on my postmodernist hat and redefine what I mean by saying war. Um, because I do think, <laughs> I do think destruction, I do think this destruction and like not a creative destruction, but like a, an actual negative destruction. I think waste is a necessity of capital. Um, and I would just say, well, war, war is waste. It's just a particularly violent form of waste. Okay. But look, Theo, you said, you said that I am assuming. Yeah. The people in a room will always agree in the end. If you listen to what I just said, if you go back and play it back, I did not say that. You're assuming it will always lead to war, that war is always necessary. That's not the same thing. You're, if you're saying war is always necessary, or at least you open the door for that. I did not open the door for that. You opened the door for that. I was very clear. People getting together in a room can change the course of history. Sure. I didn't fucking say it always does. I'm not an idiot. I wouldn't have said that. That would be a stupid fucking thing to say, though. That would be a stupid fucking thing to say, though. No, I'm serious. Dude, like, the moment people use these little, like, oh, cup, well, that's just capitalism. Oh, the, 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 the mental health crisis today, it's just capitalism. That, I'm not mad at you, Theo. I'm mad at this, this, oh, it's just capitalism thing. I, I, I just had this conversation with, uh, Nance, like, three days ago. About yeah, we, uh, just, we just had this con- yeah, fascism. fascism. Oh, everything's fascism. The moment you go there, it's just like all of these little uh, these little scripts that we get from Marxist Len- Leninists. It's like I see the point, but it also becomes this totalizing narrative that just means yeah. Well, it's just yeah, yeah. 
that just yeah, yeah resist that tendency to totalize um and i i mean that's why having a milieu fucking matters that's why i don't want to have a conversation with someone i can't trust to know what the fuck they're talking about to have done some of the reading to to be earnest and to be like to listen to what i'm saying and to tell me when i'm wrong and like all, all these things like we are trying to create a new destination. Um, so there's things that I'm going to hang on to. There's things that I'm going to do and have in my head without even being cognizant of the fact that they're thought terminating cliches. Um, and having a, a trustworthy space where we can air out these differences, right, matters. Um, is this that? I don't know. I don't We're all know idiots. Is that. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I just well, said I'm this, not an idiot. This, right now. This I just I just said I'm not an idiot, <laughs> but you're right. I am an idiot. I know that as soon as I said I'm not an idiot, I was just like, well, fuck, you know, I am. I know that we're saying that I am, but I just mean like, I do not make like these total, like when I'm being careful with my language, if I say something can make a difference and then someone says, it's not always going to, well, did you hear what I just said? That's all I mean. Um, but no, I'm a fucking idiot. A hundred percent. We, we, uh, and no, this is not exactly the space for airing that shit. You're right. But no, I'm glad it came up. Itself is I'm glad it came up because we attract a lot of people, uh, through these, through what, through Capital Mondays, through, uh, MCM Prime versus CMC Prime. Uh, we attract a lot of people who are like peeking in and they're wondering, oh, is this just more of that? Or they're looking in and they're going, ah, more of that, right? And it's like, no, it's not more of that. So on the one side, people who are thinking that we're just over here saying everything bad is capitalism and every, and, 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 and the humans have no power over anything. No, nope, we're not saying that. Um, but also, uh, we're trying to do something with this, this book that, uh, that takes like that kind of stuff, like, to the degree that it is capital, we want to take that seriously. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. not, but it's, but it's not, uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the threads that I guess I'm, I'm definitely following out through this as we are thinking about, well, we're approaching the Levinas course and totalization, right? How, mm -hmm. how every attempt to understand the whole and history does lead to this. You have a bunch of thought terminating cliches. That then actually sets you up to justify a genocide. And usually, mm -hmm. usually where you're scapegoating civilians in the population. Oh, it's the counter revolutionaries. Got to round them up. Up. Oh, just got to keep rounding them up. Up. Oh, secret police. Just got to keep rounding them up. Uh, oh, it's the Jew. Oh, it's the Jew. And now this is, this is how there is a fair way to, co uh, to contrast all total totalitarianisms insofar as secret police are normalized as disappearing people from their households. If they might've fallen under the scapegoat category, which is either counter-revolutionary or Jew, or, you know, you can go down the line. It could be the gypsies. It could be this, it could be that. Could, oh, they're gay. Oh, oh, whatever. But, uh, this, the scapegoating civilian tendency thing being justified in politics because, oh, we understand history. Now we just have to break some eggs to make a, make an omelet. Let's get to work. As soon as you're in that, wearing that hat, it's like, well, that's what I'm, de I'm defensive against that. And I just want, I, Theo already knows what I think. So it's, this isn't for Theo. Um, this is for everybody who's not thought about this yet or who has come around a lot of Marxists in the past who thinks that we're just doing what they're doing. We're not in that sense, in that sense, we're not. So, uh, this whole like red flag, uh, going up whenever we are going to come up on, Oh yeah. Capitalism's the cause of the mental health crisis right now. No, it's not. It's part of the picture. Obviously it sets the parameters and the intensification for the situation, but also people having a lot of bad ideas is literally a big part of it. Like it's actually a big part of it. <laughs> like there's bad fucking Sometimes ideas. It just be like that though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People get on some bullshit sometimes. <laughs> All right. Where are we at?
Uh, what initially concerns uh, 167. What initially? Oh yeah, you. What, well, initially, what initially concerns producers in practice when they make an exchange is how much of some other product do they get for their own? In what proportions can the products be exchanged? As soon as these proportions have attained a certain customary stability, they appear to result from the nature of the products. So that, for instance, one ton of iron and two ounces of gold appear to be equal in value, in the same way as a pound of gold and a pound of iron are equal in weight, despite their different physical and chemical properties. The value character of the products of labor becomes firmly established only when they act as magnitudes of value. These magnitudes vary continually, independently of the will, foreknowledge, and actions of the exchangers. Their own movement within society has, for them, the form of a movement made by things. And these things, far from being under their control, in fact, control them. The production of commodities must be fully developed before the scientific conviction emerges from experience itself that all the different kinds of private labor, which are carried on independently of each other, and yet as spontaneously developed branches of the social division of labor, are in a situation of all-around dependence on each other, are continually being reduced to the quantitative proportions in which society requires them. The reason for this reduction is that in the midst of the accidental and ever-fluctuating exchange relations between the products, the labor time socially necessary to produce them asserts itself as a regulative law of nature. In the same way, the law of gravity asserts itself when a person's house collapses on top of him. The determination of the magnitude of value by labor time is therefore a secret hidden under the apparent movements in the relative values of commodities. Its discovery destroys the semblance of the merely accidental determination of the magnitude of value of the products of labor, but by no means abolishes that determination's material form. That's again, Marx just saying, yes, this is bullshit, but it's real. It is objective. Reflection on the forms of human life, hence also scientific analysis of those forms, takes a course directly opposite to their real development. Reflection be begins post-festum, and therefore with the results of the process of development ready to hand. The forms which stamp products as commodities and which are therefore the preliminary requirements for the circulation of commodities already possess the fixed quality of natural forms of social life before man seeks to give an account, not of their historical character, for in his eyes they are immutable, but of their content and meaning. Consequently, it was solely the analysis of the prices of commodities which led to the determination of the magnitude of value and solely the common expression of all commodities in money which led to the establishment of their character as values. It is, however, precisely this finished form of the world of commodities, the money form, which conceals the social character of private labor and the social relations between the individual workers by making those relations appear as relations between material objects instead of revealing them plainly. If I state that coats or boots stand in a relation to linen because the latter is the universal incarnation of abstract human labor, the absurdity of the statement is self-evident. Nevertheless, when the producers of coats and boots bring these commodities into a relation with linen or with gold or silver, and this makes no difference here, as the universal equivalent, the relation between their own private labor and the collective labor of society appears to them in exactly this absurd form. The categories of bourgeois economics consist precisely of forms of this kind. They are forms of thought which are socially valid and therefore objective for the relations of production belonging to this historically determined mode of social production, as in commodity production. The whole mystery of commodities. All the magic and necromancy that surrounds the products of labor on the basis of commodity production vanishes, therefore, as soon as we come to other forms of production. As political economists are fond of Robinson Crusoe stories, let us first look at Robinson on his island. Undemanding though he is by nature, he still has needs to satisfy and must therefore perform useful labors of various kinds. He must make tools 
knock together furniture, tame llamas, fish, hunt, and so on. Of his prayers and the like, we take no account here, since our friend takes pleasure in them and sees them as recreation. Despite the diversity of his productive functions, he knows that they are only different forms of activity of one and the same Robinson, hence, only different modes of human labor. Necessity itself compels him to divide his time with precision between his different functions. Whether one function occupies a greater space in his total activity than another depends on the magnitude of the difficulties to be overcome in attaining the useful effect aimed at. Our friend Robinson Crusoe learns this by experience, and having saved a watch, ledger, ink, and pen from his shipwreck, he soon begins, like a good Englishman, to keep a set of books. His stock book contains a catalog of the useful objects he possesses, of the various operations necessary for their production, and finally, of the labor time that specific quantities of these products have on average cost him. All the relations between Robinson and these objects that form his self-created wealth are here so simple and transparent, transparent that even Mr. Sedley Taylor could understand them, and yet those relations contain all the essential determinants of value. That's Marks again. Fucking shots fired at Sedley Taylor, dude. I'm sure he had it coming, man. Fucking Sedley Marks Taylor. Marks just... <laughs> Sedley Taylor, man. Catch, catching strays. Uh Oh, hold on. The, the original German here was Herr M. Wirth, chosen by Marx as a run-of-the-mill vulgar economist. So originally, it was uh, Mr. M. Wirth. He was a, just a run-of-the-mill vulgar economist. Um, Engels introduced Sedley Taylor, a Cambridge Don against whom he polemicized. So that so Sedley Taylor is an Engels beef. Uh, Marx was just saying your run-of-the-mill economist could understand. Okay, okay. I know people say that there's no real significant difference between Marx and Engels, but I always take the side of Marx here. And I just have to say, <laughs> if if I fucking die and then people are rewriting my shit, and when I take my jab at Thought Slime in wait in, in like time <laughs> e in time energy, someone else comes along and inserts fucking it, someone that they've I'm gotta be <laughs> I'm a, I'm gonna make it say uh who do, who do I hate? I'm gonna make it say Mr. Beast. Yeah. Or just someone. <laughs> Dude, I would never dunk on that totally guy. Changed. Yeah. Yeah, like it changes the meaning entirely. It like, make make it Lex Friedman, you know. <laughs> yeah. I would climb out of my grave and come fuck with you, dude. Like I'd be like, "No. No. <laughs> no." I'd be like, "You would die." And like the light would open up and you'd see you'd see heaven's gate and i'd be standing there in the way with a baseball bat i'm like no back back in the ground yeah uh fuck all no, right it, well anyway it's like it does change man sedley taylor's is a dude that angles knew marx was just trying to say that even your average run-of-the-mill uh german economist could understand this so when he said air m Verth, that really means like doesn't mean any person in particular are we we're not talking um, about an actual person because Verth is that or is that a real person's last name let's find out i mean Verth is a real last name because Verth oh, okay. is value not but uh let's see here and Verth. Google autocomplete said I typed in hair in birth and it said with robots. So Google knows me. Yeah, Max Verth. Um, okay, so real guy. Okay. Yeah. But even he could understand it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did Google think I wanted to see that with robots, though? That's Google, you, kn you know me too well. Let us now transport ourselves from Robinson's Island, bathed in light, to medieval Europe, shrouded in darkness. Here, instead of the independent man, we find everyone dependent, serfs and lords, vassals and caesarians, laymen and clerics. Personal dependence characterizes the social relations of material production as much as it does 
the other spheres of life based on that production. But precisely because relations of personal dependence form the given social foundation, there is no need for labor and its products to assume a fantastic form different from the reality. They take the shape, in the transactions of society, of services in kind and payments in kind. The natural form of labor, its particularity, and not, as in a society based on commodity production, its universality, is here its immediate social form. The corvée can be measured by time just as well as, and the corvée is the amount that the serf pays to the lord. It's like a tax. The corvée can be measured by time just as well as the labor which produces commodities, but every serf knows that what he expends in the service of his lord is a specific quantity of his own personal labor power. The tithe owed to the priest is more clearly apparent than his blessing. Whatever we may think, then, of the different roles in which men confront each other in such a society, the social, the social relations, relates, the social relations between individuals in the performance of their labor appear at all events as their own personal relations and are not disguised as social relations between things, between the products of labor. And I would just like add to that, yeah. When you pay for a subscription under neo-feudalism today, like when you're paying for subscriptions for everything, even if you're underground, but when you're paying for subscriptions for your gym and for your Netflix, and it's like you know that you're doing that. Uh, when you pay for your tithe, you know you're doing that. When the government takes its portion of your paycheck for taxes, supposedly, um, it's like, yeah. Uh, that feels like it's coming directly out of your pocket because it is. It actually is. It's like, no, you get a certain amount of wages back. You feel like you've earned it fair and square. Maybe you should have earned more. But then they take a third of your paycheck. A fucking third of your paycheck. For, uh, by a government that nobody trusts. <laughs> nobody feels represented by. And it's radicalizing and. It's fucking potholes. It doesn't even fix potholes. <laughs> like, shout out to Anne. Like, is, she's getting radicalized. It's like, she just hates it so much. She's like, she, cause it, she, she's seeing these chunks get taken out of her Amazon paychecks. Um, and she's just livid about it. She's like, how are they taking so fucking much? Yeah, it's crazy. Like when they, she got like a, like a $500 bonus at the end of the year because, uh, she was working at Winco, which is a sorta co-op-y. Uh, place. It's like 10% employee owned. That $500 at the end of the year. That's awesome. But taxes was like 120 something dollars of that. And she was like, why do, why do, why do they tax my bonus? You know? Yeah. It's crazy. But, but the point, the point, obviously, what we're going to get to through the development of this is you don't see the surplus value. That the, that capital is getting. Like, that's the point. We see the tax, but we don't see the surplus value. And so everything feels fair and square. For an example of labor in common, as in directly associated labor, we do not need to go back to the spontaneously developed form, which we find at the threshold of the history of all civilized peoples. We have one nearer to hand in the patriarchal rural industry of a peasant family which produces corn, cattle, yarn, linen, and clothing for its own use. These things confront the family as so many products of its collective labor, but they do not confront each other as commodities. The different kinds of labor which create these, these products, such as tilling the fields, tending the cattle, spinning, weaving, and making clothes, are already in their natural form social functions, for they are functions of the family which, just as much as a society based on commodity production, possesses its own spontaneously developed division of labor. The distribution of labor within the family and the labor time expended by the individual members of the family are regulated by differences of sex and age as well as by seasonal variations in the natural conditions of labor. The fact 
that the expenditure of the individual labor powers is measured by duration appears here by its very nature as a social characteristic of labor itself, because the individual labor powers, by their very nature, act only as instruments of the joint labor power of the family. Let us finally imagine for a change on a let, let us finally imagine for a change an association of free men working with the means of production held in common and expending their many different forms of labor power in full self-awareness as one single social force. Yeah, that's the most, like, I, I don't remember him doing that in this chapter. Like, that sentence is a description of what he has in mind for communism. He just said it right there. Right? Let us finally imagine for a change an association of free men working with the means of production held in common and expending their many different forms of labor power in full self-awareness as one single social labor force. All the characteristics of Robinson's labor are repeated here, but with the difference that they are social instead of individual. All Robinson's products are exclusively the result of his own personal labor, and they were therefore directly objects of utility for him personally. The total product of our imagined association is a social product. One part of this product serves as fresh means of production and remains social. But another part is consumed by the members of the association as means of subsistence. This part must therefore be divided amongst them. The way this division is made will vary with the particular kind of social organization of production and the corresponding level of social development attained by the producers. We shall assume, but only for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities, that the share of each individual producer in the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. Labor time would, in that case, play a, do a double part. Its apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan maintains the correct proportion between the different functions of labor and the various needs of the associations. On the other hand, labor time also serves as a measure of the part taken by each individual in the common labor and of his share in the part of the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of the individual producers both towards their labor and the products of their labor, are here transparent in their simplicity in production as well as in distribution. Let's focus on this for a second. Um, do you have any thoughts on it? Before you... Yeah, like from each according to his ability to each according to his need, um, the idea of, of fairness um that would be cool like that 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 would be cool um <clears throat> i think obviously allowing for striations in personal ability like some people are just more able than others i think that's a realistic position that you can't throw away i think people would like to flatten everyone out but that's just not the case there is verticality um, but just because there's verticality doesn't mean you have to get rid of this idea of, uh, I don't know, just be, be cool. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we could all just be cool to each other? Um, like I'm cool with my family. I'm cool with my friends, my homies, like the, all the people that I, I really know and care about, uh, I do my best to be cool with them. And it's like, Hey, if I have something you need, or if there's something that I'm doing that would benefit you um i'm more than happy to do it and wouldn't it be cool if we lived in a society where that was kind of extrapolated to everybody just because we're all kind of born we have no say in it we're all here we might as well make the best of it um i think that would be cool i also think utopia while very compelling is is always a shiny object that often gets used to justify horrible things Do you feel like this is a worthy utopia?
No, because I don't want to. I, I don't want to live uh, in anything that's measured in labor and value. That like this is still ultimately measured in labor time. I am more than happy to do what I can for others. However, there is there are times when I just want to say no. I got to I got to handle some shit on my own. I I need to be able to just fart. Give me two hours where I can fart in peace. And I'm and not, not be, affecting anybody. And it's, it's not a joke. Nobody's commenting on it. It's not a, it's not a thing. Yeah. It's not a thing that should break me away from my <laughs> absorption in whatever I'm doing, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like, while this would be cool, this <clears throat> is just kind of a step along the way. Um, we should be, we should be able to just sit around and fart. And of course, what I mean by that is to, uh, uh, partake in the liberating arts, right? Like I want to, <laughs> I want, I want to, I want to learn to write poetry. I want to learn to, to play symphonic music. I want to listen to symphonic music. I want to stare at a fucking tree for an hour and a half. Um, like I want to pursue the spiritual nourishment. Um, that there's no room for that in this society. That's just kind of founded on on labor and, and what is socially necessary. So while it's a good, while it's a good outlook to have, this is why debt and belonging are different things because you, you can't instrumentalize the relationship I have with my loved ones. And you can't say it just comes down to material needs. There are numinous things. There are characteristics about the people I care about that I can't put into words. And there's like, there's, there's, something that escapes instrumentalization about these interpersonal relationships. And there's something about me that escapes description and instrumentalization and it gets called the soul and it, it gets called, you know, it gets called a million other things, but, uh, this is too instrumental from, for, to be a truly utopian fucking world. Theo says expanding the inner circle in reference to the idea of getting along with more than just your inner circle, right? Then he said that all falls under the needs category in my interpretation. Needs are not the just physical needs, but also mental, spiritual, etc. Yeah, so there's a way to be super charitable here because I think I know what Marx actually means, but it's not on the page. That's the thing. It's not on the page. This is worker realism, like a hundred percent. Now I think that real Marx is, uh, I, th I, I mean, my, my Marx. It's like, it's like, uh, Talladega Knights, my Jesus. Yeah. Well, my Marx, he gets that, you know, labor, he, he, because he's not using the term time energy and he wouldn't separate labor power from other kinds of things like creative power, cooperative power. You know, he's just, it's just all labor power all the way down. Well, if we're going to do that, then I think we could also make this step to just say, yeah, 100% Theo, that these are also needs. There's mental needs, spiritual needs, and that those are also only actualized or satisfied or I guess there's no satisfying them, but the point is, is like it's a process that we get to participate in and that that's a process we can participate in with our labor powers, our individual labor powers. But it's like, and then, you know, in a, if, if we want to get a little, uh, Benjamin Studa ba Bakery in here, you know, if you've got some philosopher kings actually planning this society and it, they get like the, the conditions of the conditions that are necessary for people to be able to have the good life and they get that, um, then it would be planned in. It wouldn't be everybody spends all their waking hours making ball bearings. It would be like, Oh, you spend three hours making ball bearings. You spend a couple hours doing some chores and you get the rest of the day to yourself. Or you work two hard days, 12 hour shifts, and you get the rest of the week to study the liberal arts under some tutelage, right? Like, cool. I, I'm, I'm a hundred percent behind that society, but it's not on the page. It's not there. And I don't think it really gets, it, it's never made explicit in this trilogy yeah and it, it, it gets taken and, and turned into workerism it gets take taken and, and turned into the celebration of of labor 
Um, yeah, it's it's laying itself it out. It's laying itself out for a worker. This paragraph lays itself out for a kind of austere workerism, where it's like just take pride in the fact that you make ball bearings for for the yeah. for the mother country or whatever you know. The, that the, and that view is is saying work will set you free, right? Exactly, that's it is. the same goddamn sentiment. Yeah, yeah. And this is where Trotsky and Heidegger agree. Everyone should just live in labor camps for the rest of their lives, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, guys. Like, I get it because it's war communists. I get it, but no. Um, so, for a society of commodity. Oh, by the way, Maton is back. Hold on. I said I was going to read this. So he had said, I haven't read Graeber yet, but I do see Marx as conflating symbolic debt with material debt insofar as this conflation highlights the formal cut made between material and social production. You'll have to explain how and why. But then I asked, where do you see that? And he said, I will try to write a longer forum post. But in short, my reading of Marx, the distinction of use value and exchange value sets the stage for a view that the import of communication under commodity production lies not in the symbolic exchange between two use values, but rather the meaning of exchange insofar as it lies outside of meaning. The exchange lies outside of meaning. In other words, knowledge the meaning of social exchange is not what Marx is going to look at. Rather, how knowledge uses the exchange in its self-justification of its self-bought knowledge. That none of that makes sense to me. Uh are you following, Nance? I'm I'm um, I mean I'm 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 saying that literally I'm not following along with any of it. So I mean, if you can help me, then go for it. But if you we we could always just say, please clarify. Yeah. Actualize. Yeah, no, I think like if if Matan is is saying like no, Marx is kind of commodity production lies not in a symbolic exchange between two use values, but rather the meaning of exchange insofar as it lies outside of the meaning. I think, yeah, like Marx is saying this uh this happens at this pre-conscious level that we take for granted that that kind of covers up like natural form becomes the natural form of a thing becomes its use value, which is the use value of a thing is just its exchange value in, in the social relationship. I, I think, and I would agree, yeah, Marx is, isn't talking about symbolic exchange. He is talking about material conditions, but I don't think, I don't think that's what he's, Matan's saying here. The, uh, the knowledge exchange in itself is just, or, in itself, justification of itself as knowledge. Yeah, like these commodities posit this yeah. value, which I don't know. I don't know. Lewis, write it. Idiot proof that, please. Idiot proof it, please. Write like foreign Mikey. Post, great. No, there's Longer no. Longer forum post. This will perfect. not be in a forum post. There's no, there's no forum. <laughs> there's no forum. Do. Though I did get the uh, the old forums restored so that we can do the moving party here in a couple of days, don't post to the forum. It will get deleted because like the forum has gone away. Like that's not a thing anymore. So don't do that. Um, but yeah, definitely. If you want to develop that as a thing, maybe you are interested in writing about and stuff. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to set up. Uh, like if you want to present on this, for instance, at the conference. Uh, or you're interested in one of the anthologies and this is a thesis you're interested in developing, Andy's going to help you a lot uh, in terms of idiot-proofing it for me. Also, it's harder for me to follow along on stream, but also it is, when, whenever we're doing this thing, it's like, okay, I don't know that we're using any of the words the same way, so you actually have to stop and explain how you're using every one of these words so that we know that we're using the words the same way because otherwise I'm not sure where you're at, you know? Like, I don't know... It's like, I think I get like the part about Marx being in the discourse of the economist. I get that. Uh, and that's the main part I get here. But the rest of it's like, have you read the three volumes? Are you going off of just what we've done here? Are you going off of some 
knowledge of something outside of what we've just done here. Uh, if you have read the three volumes, then how does what he does with the exchange later factor in? These formal cuts that he's making are functional, not ontological. Um, he's very, well, I don't, I wouldn't say that he's super clear about that, but he's often pretty clear about that. For instance, like even just here, he said, we shall assume, but only for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities that the share of each individual producer in the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. He's good at saying when he's assuming something and then kind of clarifying where he's coming from. Um, so in the same way, it's like, I said, well, he's not always good at it. Uh, and, and so, uh, Grundrisse is a good example where it's like, no, that's where he comes out and shows that these formal cuts are not so formal for him. This is more of a, this is more of a means of, of exposition, right? Like we have to remember that he's doing an exposition for people who are super into political economy. So it's like, it's one thing to be like, no, he's the political economist. And it's another thing to be like, no, he's doing an intimate critique of this. And then there's always this question of like, well, but how many of the terms or assumptions of political economy does he actually take to heart and then not uh, unravel later in the process here? And it's like, I think that what we were getting at about symbolic exchange is like, yeah, uh, I don't think that that's in here. Though he does have some kind of a sense for it, I think he has some kind of a sense for it, but I don't think we're going to get it on the page. Uh, not Not so clearly. So then how do you mean all of these terms vis-a-vis -vis the text and anything else that you might be referring to or there might be – that's – yeah, so it's an essay. So yeah, 100% if you want to develop an essay out of this. Did you uh, catch the video I sent out to all the students at Theory Underground, by the way, Matan? It was for the call for proposals that we did with Andy because even if you're not interested in, say, developing this as a piece, like a piece piece. Um, and he's still making that offer and I would, uh, try to set you up with him in order to, so it's not just a forum post. Um, I would want it like, I think you should run it by him in terms of this way you get a chance to meet him. You get someone on one time. It's free for now. It won't always be. And, uh, it's, it's worth, it's worth, how, what would you say? I mean, not, not in terms of money, but like, what was it worth to you, Nance? Or, or like, or like, how, how did it impact you doing that with Andy? So talking to Andy for the past, I don't even know, several months, I haven't been writing. I've been, I've been busy, but I've also been kind of like preoccupied and I just haven't written as much as I would like to have written. Um, and talking to Andy, like he called me out in a very humane and empathetic way. But like basically, he's like, okay, put 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 it all out on the table. And then he's like, Well, you you know what's bullshit, you know what's not bullshit. Um, which I I appreciate that. I don't think like no, I'm not saying, oh, he's a husky gruff guy. I think he's a very sweet, very, very caring guy. And I, I think he wouldn't always take that approach if someone else doesn't need that approach but i respond well to that approach of someone calling me out on my bullshit uh he called me out on my bullshit he was a very supportive very fucking friendly guy in the past week since i spoke with him i've written more than i've written over the past year probably um and he got me excited again to write because he's like well why the fuck are you writing in the first place is it just to hear yourself talk and that's part of it right but also no i feel like i have something to say i feel like i have something worth saying um and he's like well here's some some tools to help you say that legibly say that in a way that that other people can understand that will resonate hopefully with other people so they can actually respond because i believe what i have to say isn't worth saying sh screaming into the void if i did i would go back to just writing weird poetry or whatever the fuck it was like i do believe what i have to say is only worth saying in the structure of this shared milieu that we're trying to create. So I want to, I want to contribute to a conversation. I don't just want to shout at a mountaintop how displeased and dissatisfied I am. Um, and Andy seems to be very, very on that same frequency um, of, of developing a kind of milieu where things actually do matter. So talking to him and sitting through the 
the call for proposals kind of relit my fire. Um, and it was dope. And I can't, I can't, I can't wait. I'm also going to bug the shit out of them because I do write a lot when I am writing. I do write a lot. Um, and he's made himself available for me to ask stupid questions and bounce dumb ideas off him. That's not to say I'm going to bounce every dumb idea I have off of him. But <laughs> <laughs> that's for me. That's what I'm for. You know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You've got me and Mikey for that shit. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, I think by setting it up as he called you on, 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 on your bullshit, like first, the, the degree to which he is like this over, like just this fucking incredibly nice guy got, uh, covered over just a little bit. And that's why I want to emphasize that he's got this way of making me feel challenge to be better without ever saying it like that's the thing yeah yeah so he yeah he he draws it out he he draws it out in, in a very empathetic way and he really makes you f- believe no there is value in here or in here somewhere and he helps you draw it out and this is not just to you Matan. we wouldn't i mean i think we would have said all this to you just anyway if we were just in a Zoom call and it was just the three of us, we would have said all this stuff probably just the same. But this is for everyone else as well. So Theo, uh, Nikolai, I don't know if either of you have actually met with Andy yet, but you really need to. Uh, just take something that you're working on, uh, whether you've written it yet or not, whether you have a draft yet or not, uh, set up an appointment while you still can. Uh, I'm, I, I say that because there's no guarantees he'll be here in two months. Just do it now. Everyone needs to, like, on the one side, we're always saying we're doing this for people in the future. So I think people get the sense that it'll be around forever. But it's like, I mean, the forum just got lost. People come and go. Like, we really, you got, we've got somebody who has a PhD in composition and rhetoric who did his master's and dissertation with Todd McGowan on his uh, committees, um, giving us these free consultations and helping us for those who want to be in the anthologies, but also just helping people right now. And it's just a thing that he's doing as a, as a service. He's only got four slots per week that he can give to theory underground people, but it's just a gift that he is giving me and it's amazing. And so I really do. I do. I do love it. It's free for now, Theo. Yeah. It's free for now. Uh huh. Yeah. For now. Uh, because the thing is, is he obviously just has limited time energy when it comes to all this stuff. So, you know, Oh my God. <laughs> Wesley Curry the second is back. <laughs> Love that guy. Anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> uh, yeah. So everybody shout out to Andy. He's our new writing coach. Uh, and we'll hopefully be doing a class, uh, with him soon. I got information on that coming. So pay attention to your email. Also, Matan, if you didn't get that email, email me at hello.theoryunderground at gmail.com. And I'll send you all of that shit because if I forgot to send it to you somehow, let me know. Take it away, Nance. For a society of commodity producers whose general social relation of production consists in the fact that they treat their products as commodities, hence as values, and in this material form bring their individual private labors into relation with each other as homogenous human labor, Christianity, with its religious cult of man in the abstract, more particularly in its bourgeois development, in other words, in Protestantism, deism, etc., is the most fitting form of religion. In the ancient Asiatic, classical, antique, and other such modes of production, the transformation of the product into a commodity, and therefore man's existence as producers of commodities, plays a subordinate role, which, however, increases in importance as these communities approach nearer and nearer to the stage of their dissolution. Trading nations, properly so-called, exist only in their in the interstices of the ancient world, like the gods of Epicurus and the Intermundia, or Jews in the pores of Polish society. Those ancient social organisms of production are much more simple and transparent than those of bourgeois society. But they are founded either on the immaturity of man as an individual when he has not yet torn himself loose from the umbilical cord of his natural species connection with other men or on direct relations of dominance 
and servitude. They are conditioned by a low stage of the de development of the productive powers of labor and correspondingly limited relations between men within the process of creating and reproducing their material life, hence also limited relations between man and nature. These real limitations are reflected in the ancient worship of nature and in other elements of tribal religions. The religious reflections of the real world can, in any case, vanish only when the practical relations of everyday life between man and man, and man and nature, generally present themselves to him in a transparent and rational form. The veil is not removed from the countenance of the social life process, in other words, the process of material production, until it becomes production by freely associated men, and stands under their conscious and planned control. This, however, requires that society possess a material foundation or a series of material conditions of existence, which in their turn are the natural and spontaneous product of a long and tormented historical development. Political economy has indeed analyzed value and its magnitude, however incompletely, and has uncovered the content concealed within these forms. But it has never once asked the question why this content has assumed that particular form, that is to say, why labor is expressed in value, and why the measurement of labor by its duration is expressed in the magnitude of the value of the product. <clears throat> These formulas, which bear the unmistakable stamp of belonging to a social formation in which the process of production has mastery over man, instead of the opposite, appear to the political economist's bourgeois consciousness to be as much a self-evident and nature-imposed necessity as productive labor itself. Hence, the pre-bourgeois forms of the social organization of production are treated by political economy in much the same way as the fathers of the church treated pre-Christian religions. The degree to which some economists are misled by the fetishism attached to the world of commodities or by the objective appearance of the social characteristics of labor is shown, among other things, by the dull and tedious dispute over the part played by nature in the formation of exchange value. Since exchange value is a definite social manner of expressing the labor bestowed on a thing, it can have no more, it can have no more natural content than has, for example, the rate of exchange. As the commodity form is the most general and the most undeveloped form of bourgeois production, it makes its appearance at an early date, though not in the same predominant and therefore characteristic manner as nowadays. Hence, its fetish character is still relatively easy to penetrate. But when we come to more concrete forms, even this appearance of simplicity vanishes. Where did the illusions of the monetary system come from? The adherents of the monetary system did not see gold and silver as representing money as a social relation of production, but in the form of natural objects with peculiar social properties. And what of modern political economy, which looks down so disdainfully on the monetary system? Does not its fetishism become quite palpable when it deals with capital? How long is it since the disappearance of the physiocratic illusion that ground rent grows out of the soil, not out of society? But, <clears throat> to avoid anticipating, we will content ourselves here with one more example relating to the commodity form itself. If commodities could speak, they would say this, Our use value may interest men, but it does not belong to us as objects. What does belong to us as objects, however, is our value. Our own intercourse as commodities proves it. We relate to each other merely as exchange values. Now listen how those commodities speak through the mouth of the economist. Value, exchange value, is a property of things. Riches, use value, of man. Value, in this sense, necessarily implies exchanges. Riches do not. Riches, use value, are the attribute of man. Value is the attribute of commodities. A man or a commodity is rich. A pearl or a diamond is valuable. A pearl or a diamond is valuable as a pearl or a diamond. So far, no chemist has ever discovered exchange value, either in a pearl or a diamond. The economists who have discovered this chemical substance and who lay special claim to the critical acumen 
to critical acumen, nevertheless find that the use value of material objects belongs to them independently of their material properties, while their value, on the other hand, forms a part of them as objects. What confirms them in this view is the peculiar circumstance that the use value of a thing is realized without exchange, in other words, in the direct relation between the thing and man, while inversely, its value is realized only in exchange, a social, in a social process. Who would not call to mind at this point the advice given by the good Dogberry to the night watchman Seacole? To be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but reading and writing comes by nature. Bum, 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 bum. And that's it. That's the end of chapter one. Bum, 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 bum. So, value as a property of things. Value as exchange value as a property of things. And use value is a property of man. Value in this sense necessarily implies exchange. Riches do not. So this is. Yeah. Like wealth is. Wealth is social value. Whereas a thing. Like. <clears throat> thing is useful on its own but doesn't have exchange value so like exchange value covering up the value of a thing and like exchange value being taken as this natural property or quality of a thing this is what Sahil was was going on about that I really liked when he talks about it's like a three part process. It's not just it's not just use value and exchange value. Value is this real thing um, that's only realized in exchange, and so we we can we have no access to value. We can't see value. We always take exchange. We always conflate exchange value and value. Um. I don't know. I really like, like the way Sahil laid it down. Yeah, and tomorrow for subscribers um, is the lecture with Sahil. Uh, it's and by the way, I only send out the email uh, about that to the people who told me they want to get the email. So if you're a subscriber and you want to get the email about that, then let me know. Um, but Sahil gives a lecture on the first Monday of the month. And in the email I sent out, I said that he would be lecturing on chapter two of volume one. Then he messaged me and he was like, actually, I'll st I've still got some stuff I'm going to be doing on chapter one. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. But he will also probably be getting into chapter two. And so, uh, yeah, the process of exchange. We're going to get into it. But that distinction between wealth and, and value is important. And I know it's important because these people talk about it. And I, by these people, I mean when I'm reading people who are taking this project seriously. They'll talk about that distinction. Um, what I'm curious about, though, is like, is he going... Like this is a, this distinction only exists because of the commodity form. The commodity here, it would say to you, our use value may interest men, but it does not belong to us as objects. What does belong to us as objects, however, is our value. Our own intercourse as commodities proves it. We relate to each other merely as exchange values. Now listen to these. Now he's saying, now listen to these commodities speak through the mouth of the economist. And then this distinction comes out the mouth of the economist and and is his point that 
yeah, this is how it, it works, but this is fetishization. Is that still going yeah, on? Yeah, like here? he's he is he's yeah, he's describing he's describing the situation. Um and again, in societies where the where commodity production is dominant or whatever, how however he says it exactly, like he is always talking about capitalist societies. Um which is kind of weird because he then he, he he then does go on sometimes to transistorize value, and he definitely does it with labor. Um, but yeah, this part right here, this is what the commodity form is is doing. Um, and the the economists would have us believe that value is just exchange value. The economist would have us believe that okay, wealth okay. is is like um <clears throat> damn i thought i had a really good way to put it but no no you're you're doing great on. i, I and can you stop the brussels sprouts in a sec because i started those downstairs thinking that uh, I was, I thought we were going to be at this for another like half hour and I was like, I'm too hungry. And so I was like downstairs washing dishes, cooking Brussels sprouts. And then you finish the chapter and I was like, I thought we had so much more ground to cover. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I don't want to burn my Brussels sprouts, but anyway, uh, yeah, it is like, so the economist is like value. And then Marx is like, by which he means exchange value. And then the, the, he, the, the economist goes riches. And then, he, and then Marx is like, by which he means use value. Right. And I think that that yeah. is what's going on. Now it, it's, I, I guess I kind of want a second opinion on that. I don't know if there's some German norms. Too bad we don't have Rudy here. I had a few questions as far as translation go. We miss you, Rudy. Um, but the, uh, yeah, the, the parentheses as opposed to brackets. I don't know if that matters. I don't know how that translates. I don't know if he is doing this by which he means, or if he's doing this, like the economist says value, which is this thing. And it's like, but either way, I think, I kind of think Marx is saying it more like by which he means, which is to say value is not exchange value, but obviously that's what it has become. Uh, Riches are not just use values, but that is what it has become. Um, I think that that is here, in which case then value is a property of things, riches uh, of man, or are an attribute of man. Value is the attribute of commodities. Yeah, so you say it both ways. Mm -hmm. And those are actual quotes, right? Are those actual um, quotes no. or no, they're not actual quotes, but what's the footnote then? Oh, it's from Shakespeare. Um, no, no, no. That first line, that is observations on some verbal disputes in political economy, particularly relating to value and to supply and demand. Um, London. Oh, so those are potentially quotes. Oh, hold on one sec. Yeah. Okay, let's let's look that up. Let's observations on but but uh okay, it is a quote. Love you. Damn, we need to get a P uh we need to get a PDF of this. That's that's Samuel Bailey. Um damn. What what what? Sorry, I, I was saying about it, and what happened? Bye, Anne. So, yeah, these are quotes from Samuel Bailey. Um, this is a quote from observations on some verbal disputes in political economy, particularly relating to value. And. Okay, same book. So, yeah, we need to get a PDF of that book. So, so Samuel Bailey, if I remember right, is somebody who argues against the labor theory of value in defense of an exchange theory of value, I thought, um, and that Marx uses him doing that to kind of 
uh, sublate that back into this project. Um, but maybe I got it wrong and it was actually he was a defender of the labor theory of value. I, but, I, but either way, what Theo is saying here is that the economists, I'll show it on screen, the economists believe that value is a property of things and not social relations. Which obviously, if anybody's been following the debate here between Theo, Rudy, and Sahil, then, and really just like all of us who are like flirting with this value form theory, then, yeah, does that line, can you go back up? Does that actually support, um, with Theo saying, uh, so, uh, the economist says that value is a property of things and riches of man. Value in this sense necessarily implies exchanges. Riches do not. So, I mean, value implies exchanges. So, I mean, in this case, the economist, um, is not going to have a problem with exchange being a fundamental factor, right? Because that the exchangeability is the difference between value and riches. So you could have a and bunch of right, but yeah, you could yeah, have yeah. a bunch of useful things in your in your workshop, but as soon as you put price tags on them, or or, or as soon as that the we live in a global market where they have that those price tags on them anyway, um, well then value factors in right, and so. Then the other quote is riches are the attribute attribute of man. Value is the attribute of commodities. Yes, which is just a, a reversal of what he just said. It's the same way, it's just put in the different order. A man or a commodity is rich. A pearl or a diamond is valuable. A man or a community is rich. Did I see commodity? Yeah, a man or a community is rich. A pearl or a diamond is valuable. A pearl or diamond is valuable as a pearl. Um, I don't see, I see this, this is why I was kind of asking. So when he says now out the mouth of the economist, does he mean the economist is wrong? Does he mean the economist is stupid? Cause sometimes he does mean that. So, um, I was, you know, kind of wondering those things. And then what you said, Theo, um, he is saying that it's the value is a property of things. But he's also saying it implies exchanges right here. Theo yeah, but that saying, doesn't look. Theo is saying that he means that the economist is wrong. What were you going to say? Yeah. Like in, in this exchange, in this social relation, this value, this exchange value is taken as a natural property of things. And it, it's not even taken as a natural property of things like it it covers up the thing itself and the thing itself becomes nothing more than this quantization this mathematical quantity of of value um i mean you could even say like that's where sign value comes from the fact that like the commodity form erases the use values and makes everything nothing but an exchange value. Um, so yeah, just because exchange is a necessary part of it um, has nothing to do with taking exchange value as a property of things like taking the, taking the value, the exchange value as a property of things is where the problem lies. I mean, I'm sure locating value in exchange rather than production or whatever is, is can also be drawn out. But for this right here, I don't think it's in the exchange where the problem lies. I think it's in the being a natural property of things is where the problem lies. There, yeah. The says, value belongs value. to the commodity as opposed to the people creating it. The economist has it reversed. Exactly. But also, it is true. It it is it it is true that when I am working, I am transmuting parts of my soul and imbuing 
the objects of my productivity with that substance that is taken as value. That is also true. Like it is an accurate description of the way the world works. And that's the shit that I, I just kind of want to keep thinking about. Like that is between the strange labor uh, lecture and then today. Uh, and what I'd said earlier about the, I think Solusky actually, but when he left, what did he say? How did he say it? Uh, but what, what is wrong with my tracker here? How do I? Okay. Okay. Got it. Sorry, you all can't see what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something off screen, but yeah, he said this poem is sad as hell. Gotta go to Easter stuff. I'll watch this later. See ya, homies. Bye, Solosky. Um, but the poem he was talking about is the, the nerve, the nerves, the brain, the muscle, the, that goes into the thing. And then I was adding all the other stuff that that means. And yeah, if you have a strictly positivist standpoint, you can still see what's going into the commodity. But a purely positivist brained kind of person is not able to see what's not becoming of the human in that situation. What horizons of possibility are foreclosed? What calling gets frustrated? What talents go undiscovered and lie dormant and lead to I mean, I, at this point, I kind of just, I, I almost want to say, like, I have like this sort of vulgar folk psychology theory where I would just say, when your talents lie dormant and then they, they don't get discovered and then they just, they just stay there in atrophy, uh, those turn into mental illnesses. Like that, I, I, like, I, I know it's full, it's, when I say a folk psychology, I'm just saying that this is a, 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 a vulgar way of talking, but I, yeah, I, that's kind of how I'm thinking of it. And of course that there is all kinds of ways of problematizing it and getting more granular, but it's like, nah, like that is basically how I'm thinking about it. Um, in the most, no, dude, I possible. like it. I like it because it, it, it kind of demonstrates the grotesquerie of the system that we're in, right? Like to think of us as, these virtual purposive creatures to, to yes. think of us as empty vessels um, that are waiting to be filled. And it, it's, it's up to us and our activity it through our activity, we can fill our, our vessel. We're just waiting to, to be filled, but we're not able to. And so this void becomes filled with like these monstrous, I don't know this monstrous energy that that does. I, I I mean, it's important to be careful when talking about mental health on the internet. Blah blah blah. Let's say all the caveats. Yeah, yeah. Let's do all those things because we're not like, experts. It's Don't true. Trust experts. Care, but yeah, but like no, like it is. It is. It is fucking horrible. And and when all we can do, I mean, Jesus Christ, dude. If anybody, like all of you on the internet, you're aware of all the horrible things that have happened. All the tragedies, you know, all the death and just fucked up bad shit that's come out of our inability to act, our inability to, to really do anything real and like human in this world. We're so instrumentalized. And so we have tragedies that occur um, and personal tragedies and also public tragedies. Like people go off and, and commit random acts of violence and shit. We're all being turned into depressed ravening creatures um and i do think that's accelerating and not to say capitalism is the only cause of it but capital is creating these conditions where these tendencies um accelerate and we're all behind the eight ball and and it's so hard to take a step back and it is true that it's hard to take a step back and some people can't take a step back and they'll never be able to and we should all see that as a fucking tragedy. But those of us that are able to, we owe it to ourselves. And we, sh we should like take on this belonging, right? To the human fucking race or whatever. We, sh we owe it to all the other humans on this fucking planet, past, present, and future. Take a step back. Like 
do something with your life. Um, or, and this is why, this is why it's so easy for me to go back to that dark 15 year old place. Cause I do believe it is, a, it, it, it really has come to that. Like either you're doing the thing or you're bullshitting and that's okay. You can be a bullshitter if you want to be a bullshitter, but if you're really serious about it, fuck you do it or don't do it. Like it, it really does come down to like, no, it is up to you because that, that first step that is so hard to take. And again, that's often impossible for people to take. And I don't want to otherize or minimize or let's not forget about the people who can't take the step, but we all do. Let's be honest. We all have the fucking free time. We all have social media. We can scroll. We can talk shit. We can do all the things. Let's stop choosing to do all those things. And let's actually start choosing to do something human for once. And that's why I get so angry about it because the people who are like, oh yeah, it's just, you know, it's so hard are also the dudes who are just wasting time. Like, fuck you, dude. Be about that shit. Don't be a bitch. Shit or get off the pot. If you have the ability to do so. And most yeah. people don't, right? Most people on this planet don't live here in, in America where they have the luxury of all this free time. Most people don't. India has 1.6 billion people. China has 1.4 billion people or whatever. Like, like those motherfuckers are just in factories all day long. That's it. Sahil did like, say, <laughs> Sahil did say, he, there, there's, there's more than just a couple guys like him <laughs> who are supported yeah. by their wives, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so shout out to the ladies, you know? Yeah. And no, that's, that, that's some gangster shit right there, you know? Uh, but it's, a, that, that's a family that's not going to get to be functional in a, in a, in a more, human way right so it's like it's better than nothing when one person takes on the burden for the others but also that sucks and also uh it's it leads to broken homes like that is what it leads to um and i think that that's the part that i care about the most increasingly is like people it's like the conditions of possibility for self-actualization is usually the focus with time energy theory, but the conditions of possibility for having relationships and family and community is always like the part that I feel more strongly about. It's like the 36 year old part of me. I am that old, by the way, but the 36 year old, I know everyone's like, what? You're not 26, but like the, the 36 year old part of me, that is like, I gotta do stuff. I gotta make something happen. Like that part of me focuses on the self actualization shit. But my whole life is looking towards, I wanna actually have relationships. I wanna actually have a, a good relationship with my child or children. Um, and, and be able to have like a, a good marriage and family and, uh, network with other parents and families and, like, I want to be able to do that. I really want to actually be able to do that. Now, it's like some people just give up. They, uh, it's not possible. Well, I'll leave, Me I'll leave and go to Mexico or I'll go to anywhere else in the world where it is possible. I don't give a fuck. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. And I think a lot of people who gave up on that idea, uh, or for whom it didn't work out in the United States, um, either might think at some point if they gave up on that idea, they might think about leaving and trying again elsewhere where it might be possible. Um, but it, but if, if that fucking, if that boat already sailed and you already missed the opportunity because now you don't really have those relationships, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like spilt milk. What can you do? Now they have to want to have a relationship with you. You can't just go out there and try, you know, it's like you could try somewhat, but you also can't try too hard when a person, when you've missed most of the most formative moments in their life, now you're kind of that guy. And it's like, ah, now you're kind of fucked for the rest of your life. What are you going to do? Well, if that kid wants to strike up a relationship with you at some point, well, then you, you know, you're there and you're ready. But it's also like, you're kind of the stranger now. And it's like, that's, now people either, they don't live with their family or they live with their family, but they don't live with their family, right? 
like think of COVID and all the people who started living together and being like, I fucking hate my husband and oh my God. And then like you have these dads beating their kids and shit. And it's like people offing themselves because it's like they were already social distancing within the, the family unit to such a degree that like, they're like, who the fuck is this person? I hate this person. I can't stand this. Right. And it's like, well, yeah, because you know who that person is. That person is broken. The person is a broken human being, just like you, motherfucker. You're, you're a split subject and you're split not just between your conscious ego and your drive. You're also split between your current, uh, habits and your genuine own most potentiality for being like your actual project, your real calling, your, your, uh, your uncultivated spoiling talents that in a certain sense, it's never too late to find and to develop, but also at a certain point, maybe it is too late. And, you know, it's like one of the biggest, saddest realizations that I've had over the last eight years, probably is just the, oh, like people get broken and then they, they don't take it on themselves to become part of the, they're going to be more than that. And they've given up. And a person who's given up is already off themselves in a sort of sense. And so, of course, you're kind of there and you're trying to be there for them. And that used to be me, man. And so that's why I'm saying over the last eight years, it's been like, I got to just, I, 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 I used to put it in terms of mental health. I don't do that anymore. I used to say, I got to prioritize my mental health. I can't be dragged down by people who got problems like I do. Like those people need help from people who aren't like me also needing to like work on them. It's like you got, there's people you can work on yourself with and there's people who uplift you and motivate you and make you better because they ultimately are saying, yeah, I'm fucked, but I'm trying, I'm doing what I can. And there's people who are like, nah, man, they turned it in a long time ago and they might be banging heroin, or smoking oxys or uh, doing cocaine every weekend or shopping on Amazon every day Every day they're on Amazon or they're drinking with their buddies at college or like there's just, you go down the line, um, or they're just playing, they're putting hundreds of hours into video games, you know, with like reliving what it was like to be a teenager. And it's like, cool guys, like that's great, like fine. I mean, we all have to do that to some extent, but also there is a more than that that you are. There is a more than that that you are. And it's that you that is more than that, that goes unactualized, that is spoiled. And you don't see it in the other within that household. And they don't see it in you. And there's like a really superficial way of saying namaste, right? Oh, like the divine in me sees the divine in you. But like there's actually like a deep sense for it too, which is like, oh, the part in me that isn't a fucking worm sees the part in you that's more than what you are now and sees that you can always be something more. Like it's, it's one thing to just accept people as they are. I think that some degree of that is necessary as just love, like love requires it. You accept a person as they are with their flaws, but it's also another thing to be like, and I know that you're like this bomb of possibility or this, uh, like suffering bulb that wants to become a, f like a flower. Like I, I also see that. So you're going through some shit, but that possibility is still there. And the point is, is like when, when you're putting your nerves and your sweat, blood and tears and labor, uh, into products your whole life and or services your whole life. Um, yeah, you're not cultivating that, that divine in you. The sees that this is a Heideggeri mode of analysis. Yeah, man, it is in a sort of sense, right? Except that I like how Studebaker pushed back against the, it's, you know, it's the possibility, no more possibilities, the finitude makes this all, no, it's also just love. Like, the idea that love is an irreducible and that love and the good is prior to analysis, is prior to thought, is prior to, uh, rationalization. Like, 
I'm, I'm, I'm into it, man. And it goes really, really, really fucking good with Levinas. And so it's like, you can't just go back to Plato and Aristotle, uh, because you're a Cartesian subject. You're like post, you're atomized society. Like, even if you like Eastern philosophy, it's inaccessible to you. You lack the background conditions of intelligibility to make that legible in the first place at the real level. But through something like Heidegger's deconstruction of modernity, and of course, Marx's structural analysis of like the, of, of why it is that we are broken in this sort of sense. Then Levinas comes in with his, Oh, and by the way, the good is irreducible, but not just like a, Oh, a return to Plato or whatever, but like bringing that, bringing that idea and arguing for it while assumption, no, while assuming the, uh, the, the the bracketing and the uh the yeah the, the oh we're not going to make speculative leaps right where plato had no problem making speculative leaps uh and just being like it's the goods just like this irreducible sorry it's like no levinas is actually going to phenomenologically develop out his theory of the human uh playing within the parameters set by kant and taken seriously by husserl and Heidegger. And so it's like this return to like some kind of an idea of the good, but within the context of the political economic critique and the phenomenological structural, uh, existential critique, like of being in the world. It's everything, man. And I, j I, I'm not at this point yet. It's, it's kind of like what Studebaker said earlier about how he's got like this book in him that he wants to write to people, just like to everybody, but he can't write it yet because it's like, he's got to work out the connections and everything. And it's like at a certain, a certain level, we're able to like kind of get where he's coming from with what he's laying out. But what he's got in terms of a book for, for a broader, um, reach. He's gotta, he's gotta work it out. And it's like this, this, like, Marx corrected by Heidegger, corrected by Levinas, all of it sublated into something new situation, new possibility. It's not, it's so far from being there. But whenever we have days like today, it's like, you can start to feel it. You can start to feel it coming together. And it's like, no, yeah, these, it's coming, guys. It's, we've, we're on some really cool shit here and we're doing stuff that I just feel like needs to be done. And, you know, I, I, this is why I always go back to this calling thing. It's like, once you actually have something like that, something to live for that's more than sex. It's like when people go, Oh, my dick was cut off. I'd kill myself. I'm always just like, <laughs> I would be so relieved. And then I could just focus more on the things that I care about. Like, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> Like that is like the least of my priorities. Yeah, <laughs> That's getting to the getting to the uh post satisfaction, I think is an important step that everybody needs to get to. The idea that that you can be satisfied by not just carnal acts, but 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 anything that anything material will satisfy you and that you should spend your entire life chasing material pleasures I'd, and and it's not like saying oh, oh i'm gonna go be a rich sommelier or whatever and like make my entire life about wine like it it goes so far as like giving a shit about oh this is a michelin star restaurant i'm gonna change my whole trip and i'm gonna structure my entire trip and if you want to do it once that's cool but like if that's your regular mode of operation like being in the world really giving a shit about these creature comforts. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying asceticism is cool either. Like we do need a level of creature comforts. You do need to be comfortable. You can't think if you're constantly like unhappy, right? But you should come into a relation with your material fucking world where you don't derive happiness from that type of satisfaction. So what I am saying is go on a hunger strike, read a book, and you'll transcend time and space and don't forget us when you when you leave this material plane and you found nirvana uh standing reserve said post not clarity funny joke we were talking about yeah. making that the podcast name when we were on tour 
<laughs> yeah. we, we were yep post not clarity that was going to be the podcast name uh as a way of kind of just being like look in all honesty 98 percent of you are guys uh but guess what some cool fucking gals who follow this shit too and i think one of them might be in the chat right now in fact and uh this whole post not clarity thing is like I guess it is kind of like why I would be, the, I guess probably the reason I don't want to get my dick cut off. I get probably the main reason. It's like, what if you could never have that? I don't know. I'm kind of you worried about that. Have that post on clarity. <laughs> Shit, man. Like, you have to, uh, you have to sublate it in, into your everyday existence. Dude, you'd be like a Mormon with your brain just clogged with cum all the time. Just fucking like, <laughs> like, you know, and they knock on your door and they're like, hey. It's like, oh my god, you poor fucking child. You poor fucking thing. Let me give you a hug. Yeah. Um makes you feel sad. What is you know? happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> what has happened to our conversation? Uh soaking. This week on the podcast, we learn about soaking. For those of you that don't know, what do you know what soaking is? Oh my god, yeah. Actually, I do know because uh, wasn't it in uh, the "For They Know Not What They Do" uh, course? Michael from Zizek and so on was like talking about soaking, or was it? Wasn't that? Wasn't that when that happened? But yeah, it's like, isn't that a no? Sorry, jump humping. That was the thing. It was like the oh, Mormons, the yeah. Mormon kids, like so, so like they you put it in, but you don't thrust, you don't come in and out, you just put it in. Yeah, which that's. That's soaking. To level up your soaking game, you can jump hump where you have a homie shake the bed. <laughs> Jesus Christ. The thing's going on at Brigham Young uh, University, uh, guys. Dude. Uh, uh, Provo sucks. Salt Lake City's cool as fuck, but Provo's not. Provo sucks, dude. Hey, look, Mormons know how to do some things very well. There are some things they know how to do very, very well. They build great, yeah. uh, great buildings. They build some of the best buildings in the world. Um, at least in the United States. Well, let's be super, honest. Super Not, smooth sidewalks. It's, Salt Lake City has yeah. great sidewalks. Yeah. They also know how to like, uh, make a person feel like they're evangelizing when all they're really doing is getting entrenched in their beliefs. And the, making it impossible yes. to leave and making it impossible to leave. And then if you leave, your life will be fucking miserable and you'll be alone because no one will understand you and no one will be able to relate to you. And even if you weren't homeschooled, you might as well have been. It's a very difficult situation. And my heart goes out to every one of you guys. Um, but also I wanted to shout out to a couple people in the chat. So, uh, on the YouTube side, actually on the YouTube side, uh, who is, is Sab? Sab said, tuning in right now with my boyfriend camping in the middle of a forest in London. And then they said, we have been fans of your videos and theories since two plus years now. Tuning in while eating some soup and roasting marshmallows in the tent. Keep up the good work. I hope that you're still listening to this so you can hear me say, uh, that, that means a lot. And I love when somebody reaches out for the first time when they've been listening for a long time and actually introduces themselves. That's really cool. Thank you. First of all, the fact that you and your boyfriend are both into it is really special because I do not know many couples that both, it were, were both members like to listen to Theory Underground. It's almost always one person is transgressing their responsibilities to the relationship and the things that they're supposed to be doing. And they are instead focusing on theory underground. And I have been pulled aside and talked to by older people who are very concerned about the fact that people are, uh, dipping out of their responsibilities and focusing on theory underground stuff. And when I have had these conversations with very concerned individuals, I have told them, well, we live in a culture where it's not okay to be a guy who deeply cares about something unless the woman can see how it directly relates to her project. And that sucks because that is a relationship ender. And if the relationship hasn't ended already, it's guaranteed to, uh, if you can't work that one out, 
because obsessives gotta obsess. And most, most of the obsessives in the world tend to be guys. It's not a, it's not a fast rule though. And you also get people who like theory underground who aren't obsessives, um, and who just enjoy it, but not in that like crazy sense. And I try to make this stuff accessible to them as well, or like, so, you know, a place that, where they would be welcome, right? Like, I don't imagine Michelle Garner is an obsessive, but she's an, you know, she's, she's into theory and she loves, she loves the shit that we do. And it's awesome, you know, and I'll be interviewing her on April 18th for the Epic Marathon live stream, which by the way, is also going to have a conversation on the contradictions between Todd McGowan and Chris Catrone. And they will both be present for that conversation, and I will be emceeing. Very excited for that, by the way. I'm also looking to put together a few other contradiction conversations, including one between myself and my favorite Trotskyist, the Swolitariat. We'll be talking about our political journeys and why we don't agree with each other. And also, most of it is going to be just about our relationship. It's not going to be so much about why we don't agree with each other because I want to kind of introduce our friendship to the, the audience in a way that I think hasn't properly been done during the time that Theory Underground has been around. A lot of you have probably met Swole or seen him around, but like if you've only seen him on Twitter, then you only see him calling people names. You don't realize that he's just a really great guy. Twitter is only made for calling people names. It's not made for serious anything. And that's the medium and, and its message. But, uh, no, I'm really excited for that conversation. I'm really excited for all the conversations happening that day. There's several people, uh, that are, uh, in conversation with me right now, and we're trying to make something work so that they can be in one of these, uh, contradiction conversations. But, uh, that's going to be kind of like a, a signal boosting stream. It's to kind of get the word out to people so that they know about the European tour that Nance and I will be leaving on a few days later, uh, which, it's coming up way too fast. Um, and so we got to be working on promotional yeah, too fast. Sneaky, sneaky. We got to be working on promotional materials for that, getting those up around, uh, Europe. And so Sap, you and your boyfriend will hopefully be able to drop in and introduce yourselves in person. You're definitely welcome at the event that we'll be doing in London. Uh, we're doing something with Helen Rollins and Nina Power, uh, at an art gallery uh venue like we're very excited about it we just met the guy who puts on the events it's a very cool guy named pierre and um the that that event has room probably but i would still try to rsvp i'd still try to reach out to me so just email hello dot theory underground at gmail.com uh it's going to be a five pound uh, door entry just to keep the venue running and to compensate the bartender. But also there's potentially a couple other events that will be happening in London. And so stay tuned uh, for some of that stuff that's coming together. So Sab. And we're going to have a special, a special guest bartender at that event <laughs> at the yeah. gallery as well. <laughs> yeah, you guys we won't want to miss. Our yeah. Special he's special guest bartender. He's written many books and had sex with robots. If you don't know who that is, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know who that is, then you don't know that you obviously haven't watched every single conversation we've ever had because you would remember the guy who had sex with a robot. But uh, if you don't, then it'll be a surprise. Also, Adam is in the chat. What's up, Adam? How you doing, man? Yo, yo, yo. What's happening? Yeah, Sab. Hope to meet you there. Also, R. Rose. I don't know if I've seen you in here before. Uh, I don't know if I've seen Standing Reserve either. Which is, uh, by the way, a fantastic name. A fantastic name. To call yourself Standing Reserve. That's deep. That's super, super deep. So, you know, I love a good screen name on here. But, uh... R. Rose... Stelavi said, a vermin with potential for grace. Is that us? I think that that's kind of, 
it's from earlier, but it's kind of in reference to this idea that we're broken and but we have potential and yeah. yeah. I, I don't I like my that. only issue or, with the uh, oh take care, Theo. My only issue with the language of grace, though I do love it, uh, it's become a lot more meaningful to me recently, is uh it's like, oh, we just need God's forgiveness. Oh, we just need God's grace. And it's not about like becoming. But if we're talking about the grace to become, um, that's kind of where I think you're coming from. Then yeah, hundred percent. The live stream that will be happening on the 12th. So, you know, it's like the week prior to the 18th, uh, is on a Thursday as opposed, no, it's on a Friday as opposed to a Thursday. The one on the 18th, which is the contra, the learning and contradictions, uh, stream. That'll be on the 18th. Well, the one on the 12th is going to be on Friday. I built that around Daniel Gardner's availability because I wanted to do an all day exegetical reading of this book, this life, secular faith and spiritual freedom by Martin Hagland. This guy is kind of coming at things from a somewhat similar position to me. Uh, I would see him as like, like what, you know, this is sort of like theology, right? Like this is sort of like theology, right? It's about, I mean, it is, it is, it is about, uh, this life versus, you know, the things to come or the afterlife and blah, 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 blah. The unknowns, the knowns. Well, what, Hagland is focusing on here is that we care about what happens in this life. And insofar as you care about what happens in this life, that's based on secular faith. The faith that there might not, there, there's not something after. There's not something after this life. Like we can have faith in something after this life, but we also can't get away from having some kind of a faith that this is the only life. And that is a condition of possibility for being able to take this life seriously. And people who are 100% convinced that they know what comes after death. There's nothing more to have here, folks. Philosophy is just how many angels can dance on the head of it. You know, that whole, oh, it's basket weaving, whatever. Just you shouldn't be doing philosophy. You should be raising a family and focusing on uh, a practical job like that that whole approach it's because they think they know they they know and it's like okay because they know they're not worried about something like climate change they're not worried and even if you're not worried about climate change let's just say that you're skeptical about that yeah but you care about things in this life and insofar as you care about things in this life that is secular faith well i like even it's easy to to develop this caricature of the you know reactionary fundamentalist who just doesn't care about you know the suffering of, of people because they're so sure yeah, yeah, that they're yeah. going to be rewarded yeah, yeah. in heaven but that's yeah. a caricature i've never True. met that person in real life the most fundamentalist people i know in real life and i know some pretty fundamentalist people they still care about Im the immediacy and and they can lie and they can pretend that they don't care but like they can't escape the fact that if you poke them with a pin, like they're gonna like like they live in the real world. They do care about what's what's close to them, and they just they may not see uh, they may not see the suffering of others, and so they they can functionally not care about it. But like it's it's impossible to live in this world of surety that you'll be rewarded because you live in the material world where like you get rewards. It like. The needle poking you is real and you can't escape that reality so yes exactly exactly and i i think that there is i think that hagland is is he's not you know he's not lending himself to that simplistic uh reduction and dismissal but no you're right what i was saying yeah was lending itself to that and uh spiritual freedom has to do with our shared vulnerability and reliance on one another being the something that if it is embraced and we structure ourselves kind of with that in mind, um, that's the condition of 
being able to have freedom. Right. And so, um, it's a great book. It's very popular. It's not like a super difficult theory read. Um, and I don't know what time, but somewhat early in the day, I'll start reading it. Hopefully with Nance. We'll see. But also we're going to get a bunch of other reading partners joining us throughout the day. And where the one on the 18th is going to be like this hype stream that's like, you know, I'm going to McGowan and Catrone and Contradiction Conversation. That's been like 19 months in the making at Theory Underground, guys. If you don't know about that, the fact is, is Catrone came on, said that Lacan's a waste of time, and we brought McGowan on the following day, and he responded to why you actually need him. And so, like, this is a contradiction that w was brought up then. Both of them said they were down for a conversation, and then I never really moved on making it happen until now. And so there's a bunch of these contradictions. I don't yeah, always I move on them immediately. What, what were you going to say? I remember that. I, I remember when Catron came on and said, oh, that's worthless. I Like, I was in my car. Like, not to say I remember that. Like, I remember the day. I remember it happening. I was in my car. I was driving for DoorDash. I was sitting outside Wendy's. And I was listening to Catrone being like, oh, you don't need to read that. You don't need to take him seriously. Just read, just read Hegel. You don't need to read fucking all this shit. Like that was a while ago, dude. Like that's been brewing for a minute. Exactly. It's been brewing. And I've brought them both back on the channel multiple times since then, like three to four times since then. So it's like, uh, they all more or less trust me. We've also met them in person. We've had conversations behind the scenes. Like, so I think at this point, it's like, I didn't want to just like, let's do this now. You know, like as if I was like, you know, uh, seven years younger, I might've tried to make it happen a lot sooner, but I wanted to like give it time to breathe. And so now that we're going to be doing it, I think it will be fruitful and, uh, I'm excited to do it. But with that said, what I was talking about is that on the 12th, it's not going to be a hype stream so much as like. If you're a fellow traveler in any way, in any capacity, whether you've been on stream in the past or not, whether you've only been in Zoom calls with us, whether you've been a student or a subscriber or a patron at Ethereum Underground, um, or even if you've only like seen me when I visited Philosophy Portal to do something there or whatever, if you are aware that this is happening, uh, if you want to get involved, hit me up. There's a schedule coming together. I want to just have different people joining throughout the day. We're going to have Bram from Strange Exiles, I think, joining at one point to help read. Uh, we're going to have Daniel from OG Rose joining at one point to help read. Uh, I'd love if Michelle can also make it. I think Swole's going to make it for that. Um, potentially Brian, um, Nance, Anne's going to be there. So that's already a pretty good crew. Uh, we'll see who else wants to do it. Uh, I know that like Theo and Rudy and Kerim and who else? There's other people who do the uh oh ian of course there's other people who ian, do yeah ian yeah other people who do these uh exegetical readings already on the theory underground uh channel that we have for doing exegetical readings with other people and if you don't know about that get involved get more involved we're about to close this thing out um by the way hi mom i'm on youtube said that i should come to <sighs> Slovenia. And I said, I wish, but the only person I really know there is Zizek and he's not like rolling out a red carpet for me. He's like sick and can barely do the things that he's doing and blah, 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 blah. And Slovenians are just kind of grumpy anyway. And as a people, they're a little hard to put up with. And so he, uh, he said, <laughs> I dated I'm not this, uh, <laughs> I dated a <laughs> Yugoslavian girl and I can confirm she was grumpy. Base as fuck. I'm not saying they're not base, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I was like, I don't, I don't, I, I didn't know anybody. So I, I didn't know anybody there, so I can't make it happen. But then, um, Adam was like, Malata and Dallaire's out there, no. And I said, I don't know him. Like, I just don't know him. And then, hi, mom, mom on YouTube said, man, come on down and I can get you an interview on Radio Student, Europe's oldest and most base student led radio. Well, that is sick. That's really, that's, it that's is, a yeah. fan, that's a fantastic offer. 
Uh, if you me if you email me at hello.theoryunderground at gmail.com, we could talk about that. And then I could just be like, Jesus, I'm just down the street from you. Like, don't fucking tell me that you don't have time. Like, let me run into him at the, run into him at the post office. Let me come put no, a we red. We were red tracking you. I'll put a wet rag on your forehead. You know, if <laughs> I was already, I'll make you soup, dude. Come like, on. Like, I don't know Yela or Lenka enough off of like the couple interviews to, to, to be like, Hey, I, I want to come to Slovenia. Like Zizek, it was different because his name's on both of these books. Right. Um, but with, uh, Alenka and Yela, it's like, I can't really, it was just too weird to be like, I'm inviting myself, you know? And so I didn't try, but if I was already there doing this radio interview with you, you know, like, Hey, you know, me and Nance, maybe, you know, might have to do that. That'd be dope. <laughs> then I could just post be like, up, "Hey, we're just we're gonna buy this house. We're gonna be here. Come hang out." Yeah, and maybe you know what? But, I I want to meet right. Dolaire. I've wanted to meet Dolaire for a long time. I I just feel bad because I've never gotten to his stuff, and I've, obviously everybody puts all their focus on Zizek. And then of course, like I I've talked to. It's I feel like you got to collect them all, and there's like this super rare Pokemon named Dolaire, and I'm just like, I haven't even run into him yet. You know, we haven't fought that gym leader or whatever it is yet. Isn't that how it works in Pokemon? You got to fight the different gym leaders. Yeah, yeah. I used to well, be neighbors with Zizek. Jeez, Louise, dude, it's a small. Ljubljana is like a small fucking town, man. Like, it's a small town. Like everybody sees Zizek and they don't care. They're just like whatever, man. <laughs> That's our local. Yeah fucking apostate fucking they don't like him because he's panda. they don't like him because he's too happy you know <laughs> they're like they're like dude you're so gay you're so happy all the time we hate it you know and he's just like no i'm not i he's like unfortunately i'm still alive you know which he just said on his 75th birthday uh which was like last week yeah um thoughts and prayers Zizek. anyway do email me Everybody else, get involved. Um, don't do stuff on the forums. The website's only back for a few days. If you're watching this, I hope you'll get involved with the moving day. If you've been active on the forums before, uh, we're going to go figure out when to do that. I'm going to try to figure out when Theo and Rudy might be down uh, because they've been super active. And I just want all the people who've been super active. Sean, Sean's been super active. Sue, Sue's been super active. Chad has been super active. Who else has been super active? That's the main ones, man. But like, uh, Mandy as well. Like, look, if you've been involved and you want to help with moving day, we're bringing a lot of the stuff from the forums on the old site over to our current forum build. And, uh, we're calling it moving day, you know? So with that, thank you so much for sticking around, folks. Um, I'm going to now raid, uh, you all in the audience here into the audience of the premiere that started, I think, 22 minutes ago, which is on a strange labor. It's me and Nance doing a strange labor. And it's probably the best thing that we've done on this show. I don't know. Maybe not. But like, what do you think, Nance? Um, I. Oh, it, it did start. Yeah, I do think it is particularly good. Um Yeah, that, my TV just spoke to me. I don't know if you heard it. Yeah, I do think. No, it's, I didn't. Uh, I do think it might be. Yeah, it might be the best thing. It's definitely um, the best thing recently. Yeah, uh, it was really good. We we read through a strange labor. We had some good conversation. Um, I'm excited to to rewatch it. It was fucking like, fire. Like 50 people. So I did, I did, I did post it. I published it. 50 people, you know, watched it. And out of those 50 people, uh, Anne and probably two other awesome souls actually finished it. And the people who actually finished it were the kinds of people who had a super high tolerance to the annoying staticky buzz that was going off every minute because there was a weird plugin issue. And, uh, the rest of everybody couldn't stomach it and couldn't finish it because of the loud, Static. And so 
Nance was like, no, man, we got to do it right. And so I went and spent a bunch of extra time figuring out how to remove the hiss. I didn't fully remove it. It turns out if you listen, you'll still hear it, but it's so quiet. It doesn't matter. And so every time you do hear it quietly in the background, just remember that our love and care for this podcast and for the people who are trying to focus on the content and not get distracted by the bullshit, we put a lot of work into our audio. We have contorted ourselves into knots over the last years, several years for me, but I don't know how long Nance has been fucking with his microphone, but we fuck with our microphones a lot and we try to make things better. And you will notice that you don't hear my mouse clicks anymore. You'll notice you don't hear every little bit of breathing I do. And that's because I'm getting better slowly, but surely this stuff is getting better. And so I'm about to turn it over so that you guys if you stick around till the end of the stream, you will magically appear in the live stream of the estranged labor stream, or you can just go over there manually. But I want to also know that you came over. So please finish out the PSA. Make sure to give this a like. And, um, if you do come into the audience of the ongoing premiere for estranged labor, please say hello. Please say hello and say that you're coming over. Say that it's a raid um, because I want to see if that happens. I even if it's just a couple of you, I just want to see that happen because I want to know that it works because this is like a new feature on YouTube, I think. I didn't know about it. Um, and you can go back to the beginning and speed up to catch up, you know, 1.25 or 1.5 speed to catch up. But to all the people who are here, thank you. All the people in the future who are listening to this and you're not going to be part of the raid and it doesn't even matter. Thank you. On the podcast side, you rock it. We're trying to look out for you all by making sure this stuff stays available for you too. All right. Peace. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of the bullshit and just want to get down to it. Big ideas, rigorous thinking, and ultimately, liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. Besides a commitment to publishing certain underground theorists and popularizing certain fundamental concepts, we have toured the United States and are touring Europe to promote our ideas, courses, and publications. You've been reading Underground Theory. Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics, and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research, and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts, and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker, and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Uh, uh, uh. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been 
really pushing, but first, obviously, I have to get freed myself so the two of us are able to do this because, you know, as Mikey said, build it and they will come. Well, I tried and I built a website and platform. Uh, I had my own app and everything, but it's been really buggy and uh, it's more than one person can handle. And that's, you know what, a really good lesson for me. And so for now, what we're doing is moving it to a temporary intermediary platform until we are able to get some more serious funding. And ultimately, we want to be in a place like this, a real brick and mortar digital nomadic mecca where people can come from all over the world. But also the app was really expensive. And so by quitting it, I am now able to save a lot of money. And with the help of my patrons and the students at Theory Underground, especially the monthly subscribers, I am officially able to quit Amazon and do Theory Underground full time. So thank you so much, everybody. This is one huge step forward. My way of giving back to everybody is by promoting everyone who is at a current tier to the benefits of the tier above them, as far as subscribers go, and also rolling out a new lower tier. And so check out the tier subscription setup and if you're not interested in taking the courses or what's being offered for subscribers and you want to support anyway, check out the Patreon. Finally, just stay tuned for more information on the tour in Europe during the month of May 2024 and the conference in Mexico during the last weekend of October 2024. If you want to be there, hit me up ASAP. Let's get talking because it's happening very soon. All right. Bye-bye.